Okay, um, everybody, nice to have some chit chat, but I've just been given notice that we are live. Uh, so it is 9 a.m., uh, just about, uh, on August 23rd. So I will call the meeting to order and uh, I don't need to do roll call because I can see that everybody's here. Um, first of all, I will start with our land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that Dysart et al. is located on the Treaty 20 Michi Sagig territory and in the traditional territory of the Michi Sagig and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausoleil, and Georgina Island First Nations. These ancestral homelands are more than a place where the Anishinaabe hunted, fished, gathered, and grew their food long before the settlers' arrival. Indigenous peoples cared for these lands and waters and have welcomed us as their guest. We pay them respect by ensuring we continue to recognize our ongoing connection to the area and by supporting the health and integrity of the lands and community for generations to come. Okay, next I will look to see if there's any disclosure. Oh, just a minute. We need to adopt an agenda before we do that. Um, moved by Deputy Mayor Kennedy and seconded by Councillor Smith. Be it resolved that the agenda for the regular meeting of the Council of the Municipality of Dysart et al. held on August 23rd, 2022 be approved as presented. All in favor? Okay, so that carries. And next I will ask if there's any disclosure of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof. Okay, seeing none. I'll look to a uh, mover and a seconder to adopt our minutes from the regular council meeting and the public meeting. Uh, Councilor McKechnie, and seconded by Councilor Wood Roberts. Be it resolved, the council approves the following meeting minutes as circulated. Regular council, July 26, 2022, and the public meeting of July 26, 2022. All in favor? Okay, so that's carried. So next we have mayor and deputy mayor update. And I just have a couple things to mention today. Um, first of all, we were just talking before the meeting, the boat races uh, were here over the weekend. And um, so I've received many compliments, but I've also received a few complaints. So I do believe Andrea Mueller will be coming back with a report um, next month during the uh, committee, the whole meeting to go forward with that. Uh, there's some of the concerns were over parking and obviously the noise, but um, so we'll see where we go with that for next year or where the council will go. Um, I just want to mention too, in honor of the uh, Minden Pride Week, we are flying the flag uh, with the camera angle for those of you at home and the press can't really see it because it's very far away, but we're flying the pride flag here behind me and also at our arena. And we wish the Minden uh, Pride organization a, a great week of, of um, festivities and honoring the uh, LGBTQ community um, and, and welcoming everybody in our area here. Uh, tomorrow at the County Council, we have our shoreline bylaw and it is coming to a vote. There will be uh, a decision made at the County Council likely tomorrow. So um, for those of you who know where my stance is on that, I remain the same. Say no more on that at this point. And lastly, I just want to congratulate uh, two councillors here. Uh, first of all, to uh, Tammy Donaldson on your acclamation for Ward 3. Congratulations on that, as nominations closed last Friday, and also to Councillor McKechnie, who is acclaimed as Deputy Mayor. So congratulations to both of you. Amen. Yeah, you'll serve us well and good continuity for Dysart Council uh, going forward. And, and uh, I'm sure you'll be very busy at the county, uh, Councillor McKechnie. So that's great. Okay, so I'm just gonna turn it over to Deputy Mayor Kennedy to see if he's got anything to add. Uh, not much, you pretty well uh, covered everything. Uh, just uh, nice to see the summer starting to wind down. We've had great weather and lots of people were enjoying everything the Highlands has to offer and look forward to the fall continuing on. So thank you, that's about it. Excellent, thanks. Um, okay, so first up we have um, two delegations. So we'll bring them forward and I'll wait till I see them on screen. We have uh, Lisa Sever Severson and uh, Jason St. Pierre with Eorn. And we did receive a, a presentation in our package, but I will let, um, let them go through the presentation. So this is a returning file with some new information. We did obviously discuss this last month. We'll just wait to see the delegates.
Good morning, Lisa. Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, everybody. And good morning, Jason. Very good. good. Okay, so what I'm going to do is turn it over to you, and um, I'm not sure who's in control of your slide deck. Uh, you are or are us at this end, do you know? We are. Very good. Okay, I'll well, carry on. Well, let's say loosely right now, because I'm trying to drive this, so this may take a second. So we are loosely in control of this. <laughs> So um, it's, it's nice to see everyone um, today. I apologize. I'm going to have to shut off my video. I don't have um, great connectivity today at home. It's raining here um, outside of Prescott and um, that impacts my um, internet. Um, so my apologies. And if my um, audio um, fades out, uh, Jason will um, <clears throat> step in. So um, again, thank you for having us today. I'm Lisa Severson. I'm the Communications Director for EORN. Um, and it's always a pleasure. Sadly, we aren't able to attend in person, um, which has always been one of our, our favorite places to, to go, especially in the summertime, is the Halliburton um, area. So, um, and, I, and I'm sure uh, we, we do have a new CEO, which is Jason St. Pierre. So I'd like to introduce him uh, on behalf of EORN. So I'm not sure if Jason has the presentation ready to go, uh, but we can move forward quickly. I know you have a busy agenda today. That's okay. And Jason, we um, congratulations. Uh, and yes, we do see your uh, slide deck, the, the opening page. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Okay, so today uh, the agenda, we're going to talk about the cell gap project and then open the floor to questions um, uh, from council. So next slide, Jason, please. And I'm gonna just pop off my, I'm, I'm getting my unstable internet. So just put that, okay. So uh, next slide. So a little bit about the EORN uh, cell gap project. We actually started this initiative. Um, it started as a result of our MPs and MPPs asking us in 2014 to fix the cell gap um, issues that they were experiencing when they were traveling from their um, home ridings to either Toronto or Ottawa. So analysis we're done over the next couple of years. And after three years of um, promoting the business case to uh, both the federal and provincial governments, um, the project was awarded. So what does the project look like? We have, there are 300 existing Rogers Towers in Eastern Ontario that will be upgraded to support 4G or LTE phones and devices as well as 5G. There are approximately 265 new builds um, that will be completed over the next three to four years. Um, our network is interconnected. So it's not as if it's just building a tower and they're independent. All the towers um, interact um, and it's, a, it's an entire network that we're building across the region, which is the same size as Nova Scotia. It's 50,000 square kilometers. Uh, 75 sites will be co-locations, so Rogers will be sharing uh, tower space with either a competitor or a third-party tower um, company that has built towers. Um, we actually, that number of 195 has been upgraded since we uh, provided the slide deck to your staff. We're over, well over 200 um, upgrades have been completed. And as I said, all of our work is supposed to be completed by 2025. And we anticipate that we will meet or exceed all of the coverage goals. And after the construction of the network, we have service level agreements in place with Rogers five years after the construction is completed. Next slide, Jason, please. <clears throat> so what are the benefits of the project? So as some of you know, we do have gaps in coverage um, around the region. I live in an area where um, I'm seven minutes outside of, of two um, towns and I am in a black hole. So we actually have a cell booster on my house and I still many times have to go stand in my laundry room to be able to, to do a call. 
Um, so we don't have a landline anymore. So for us, it's important, um, as myself as an example, and I know many others, for public safety. Um, so when you need to make that important 911 call, your cell phone works and you're able to contact emergency services. Another part of the project is increased capacity. And what that means is, as you know, especially in the Halliburton area, and when you have your tourists and your seasonal um, residents coming into the area, it will tax the current um, system, the cell network that you have in place. And oftentimes, even though um, <clears throat> you, you do have coverage, you're not able to utilize your, your phone because there's just too many people trying to, to use the network. And our project will address that. Again, as I said, it'll improve municipal um, services from your public works folks to paramedics um, that are on the road and rely on um, cell coverage uh, to do their jobs. Um, we all know that uh, one of the things that tourists love to do is take pictures of the areas that they're, that they're in and post it on social media. Um, so it will be a boon to, to the tourism. And we know that with those new towers uh, comes the opportunity for deployment of fixed wireless uh, for broadband purposes. So not only um, can um, the cell uh, technology be put on those towers, but also radios that will be used as fixed wireless to improve broadband coverage uh, throughout the region. Next slide, Jason, please. So what are our goals? So our goals uh, we hope to achieve um, is 99% coverage. So in our demand area. So our demand area is where people live, people work and people travel on major roadways. And for 99% of that demand area, uh, your cell phone will work if you need to make that call. For 95% um, of, the, of the region, um, you will see improved uh, capability when you're using um, apps, doing online banking, uh, looking at email, et cetera. And for 85% of that demand area, we will, uh, you'll be able to use high, it's high definition um, services. So for example, if you had uh, paramedics who had a patient in an ambulance and they were being transported to hospital, they could actually show live video um, to the hospital so the hospital could be prepped. Or another example is you may have um, a seasonal residents up at their cottage. If they don't have great internet, they can use that cell um, connection and do what we're doing today, uh, a Zoom call perhaps. So th those are the goals of our project, and, and we do feel that we will uh, meet or exceed them. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the technology. So um, I know that there have been discussions around um, the, the towers. Um, most of the towers in our, in our network are 90 meters high. Um, we do know that we've been asked by, by other councils about um, camouflage towers or monopines. And um, one thing we can, we, we, we did investigate um, and, and speak to different carriers about that. We do know that it doubles the cost almost of a tower. Um, the reach is not as, as far. Um, so you would have to have more towers in place. And uh, one thing that people don't uh, probably realize is those um, towers do shed. Um, the, the plastic needles um, degrade uh, over time. And then just like a normal tree, when they shed, that plastic then is going into the waters and, um, and the soils um, in the area. Um, as stated before, the towers will support 4G and 5G, and um, it will definitely assist with the capacity and it helps future proof the networks for today and in the future. <clears throat> Next um, slide, please. So this is a, a map um, provided to us from Rogers. And I think you've probably maybe seen this before in other presentations from the Rogers team. This is the anticipated coverage uh, for the area uh, once the project is done. 
So the little where you see the white spots, that's from our demand mapping. Um, and that's where there are no um, necessarily um, residents or businesses in those areas. What EORN did to create that demand area is we actually purchased MPAC data. So we know where, um, where people live, people work, if it's a seasonal property, all of that stuff was um, built into our demand modeling. Next slide, Jason, please. So what does it mean for Halliburton County? Uh, there are um, a proposed 21 upgrades. So existing towers already in Halliburton County uh, will be upgraded with, with 5G equipment. Um, <clears throat> And right now, this slide is a bit outdated, but three of those upgrades are, are in service when this slide deck was created. There's uh, a proposed 30 to 40 new um, towers to be constructed in Halliburton um, County itself. We know that there are um, major gaps in the county around self-service, and um, that's, a, that's a huge investment for infrastructure um, for the region. Next, um, next deck, please, or next slide. Um, as of a little bit of our progression, so we started our formal duty to consult with our First Nation communities in January of 2021. We announced the project um, in March of 2021. As part of our work with our um, with our Indigenous communities and organizations, we have 18 that we uh, consult with. Archaeological assessments and natural heritage, heritage assessments uh, take place for each tower site. Um, as of March 14th, this again, this is an outdated slide, um, but as I said, we have over 200 of the existing cell towers already upgraded, and we have started construction on six of the tower sites. Um, and uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to make formal announcements on the completion of a few of them um, before the end of the, of the year. Next slide, Jason, please. <clears throat> so again, um, I've talked a little bit about our work with the, with the First Nations and our Indigenous organizations and communities. Um, we, we've spent a lot of time working with them and building relationships. Um, and we truly believe um, that um, this project extends to all communities, both municipal and indigenous in Eastern Ontario. And consultation isn't, um, isn't just a one and done type of, of thing for us. We will continue to consult with our um, indigenous um, communities and organizations for the life of the project. Next slide, please. So this is how um, a tower gets built. So um, the uh, Rogers has um, uh, vertical real estate agents um, that they they bring in to to find properties. So Rogers provides a propagation map of an area um, where a proposed tower would work best. Um, the real estate team then goes out and finds a willing uh, a private land owner or a municipality, um, they negotiate a lease. So once that lease has been negotiated, two things happen. Uh, EORN uh, works with um, their Indigenous communities and organizations, and we complete archaeological assessments and the natural heritage assessments around the site. And then <clears throat> Rogers um, VRE teams approach the municipality and work with them around um, securing land use authority. Uh, the regulations are laid out as to what is required. I know you do have your own policy in place, which is great for tower siting. Um, many municipalities don't, um, but there are regulations that um, they do have to follow through ISET as well. Uh, one thing I do want to clarify is notification uh, for for um, to landowners in uh, close proximity of the of the tower. So it's usually three times the tower height. That process does not take place until they've secured the lease and that they start the land use authority process with the municipality. Um, they do not do um, that type of um, notification um, before they sign a lease. <coughs> Um, 
once the once there's concurrence or when there is concurrence for that site um, from the municipality, then um, we're notified and EORN notifies the province um, that we're moving forward um, on that particular site or groups of sites. And then Rogers is uh, provided um, the, the go ahead to start construction. Uh, we do believe uh, very strongly that um, the municipalities play a very key role in, in, the, um, in, in the process. Uh, we respect your decisions around, um, around the, the tower uh, concurrence uh, component and the land use authority um, for the project. So um, uh, if we can just move on to the next slide, please, Jason. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is a bit of a financial breakdown of, of how the um, funds uh, for the project um, were determined. So both the Government of Ontario and the Government of Canada provided approximately up to $71 million each. Um, EORN, um, through the EOWC and Eastern Ontario Mayor's Caucus, nine of their 10 members um, are participating in the project. Um, collectively, there's over $10 million that are being, uh, that are being um, put into the project. And Rogers has a minimum uh, financial investment of $150 million uh, for the project. Halliburton um, for this project, for the cell project contributed 441, almost $442,000. And we also like to provide input that our administration costs run at about 6% or just under 6%. Um, in other, um, in, in, um, other types of um, project management um, costs, if you were going with an outside firm, many times they run anywhere between 10 and 20%. So we're a very lean team. We have 12 members um, and most of them, once the construction and the funding is, uh, is done, um, the EORN will have two uh, full-time staff left post-construction. Next slide, please, Jason. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what we uh, are anticipating is 20 new tower builds uh, by the end of, uh, end of this year. Uh, 20 of the colo of the 75 co-locations uh, will be in place. And we're estimating that all of the upgrades to the existing towers will be completed, um, hopefully by the end of the year, which is a, it, which is ahead of schedule. Uh, we will continue to do site acquisition. So Rogers will continue that process into 2024. Um, land use authority process because of that will continue um, consultation with the First Nations uh, as well continue and um, again there will be opportunities for both municipal provincial and federal um, politicians to help us celebrate um, when those new builds are completed. Um, I, I think the only thing I, I want to add um, to this is again um, EORN does respect um, municipal um, municipalities and and their their um, their concurrence or not concurrence of tower sites. Um, we do have a short window and a uh, and a time frame to build out this network that was set for us by um, the federal and provincial governments and. Um, if there can't be other sites that are found that. Um, can work into that network um, if, if uh, concurrence isn't provided. Um, it just means that there's a possibility that towers won't be built. And we, we don't have the luxury in five years to come back and, and fill in those gaps because the timing, our, our, our funding stream will be complete. So um, again, thank you. Um, Jason and I are, are willing, are very happy to answer questions. Um, I apologize, I'm not feeling great today. I ended up picking up COVID, um, I think at the AMO conference. So sadly, I'm not feeling great yeah. today. Well, thank so. you, you did well. I'm sorry you're not feeling well. I, I uh, didn't get AMO <clears throat> this year, but I did hear that you're not the only one that obviously that, that got it there. Um, so what I'm gonna do is open it up to the floor for questions. <clears throat> 
Lisa, I'm going to ask also um, if you and Jason don't mind staying on screen and, and not leaving the meeting uh, while we bring in our next delegation as well. So uh, at the end, there might be some combined questions, if that's okay. So I I will um, I will stay as close to ten o'clock as I can. Uh, Great. Jason can stay on um, if he's okay with that. I have we have also we also have meetings today um, that were pre booked with our our. Um, First Nations. And so I have a 10 o'clock call um, at, um, uh, well, at 10 um, with our First Nations. So I'm actually in charge of moderating that session with Excellent. Zoom. Yeah. So you you can sign, sign off at 9.55. But anyway, with that said, <laughs> Jason, if you don't mind uh, going unshare. Uh, yeah. Um, Stop. And so I can, and, and I can see everybody here. Thank you. So I'm going to open it up to the floor for uh, questions from councillors. Councillor Clark. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, thank you for the, the presentation. Interesting, and, and I think we all support the need for new technology going forward. Um, I, I, as, a, as a municipal council, we're often kind of walking a line where we're trying to represent the interests of our community going forward that they have the proper infrastructure in place, but also uh, recognizing you know, the, the interests and, and uh, longevity of our, of our existing residents. And um, I guess where we run into some, some complexities is if a tower is going to be located in close proximity to, uh, you know, a long-term residence that's been there for generations in some cases, um, that they should be heard um, if they have some concerns about a site being selected. Um, I guess my only concern about it is a little bit of a logic issue that you've got in, on your, in your process. And, and what you've mentioned is, is the fact that you, you identify a location before you will all initiate the public consultation. And to me, what you're going into is as opposed to trying to find a, find a, a, a solution or identify issues up front, you're going into a situation where you're trying to defend the, the site you're picking um, as, as, a, as opposed to uh, a, a dialogue with the people who are in that particular neighborhood and, and may have questions as to why that, that's, that site is the best. So, um, any any thoughts as to to or opportunity to to streamline or at least to to make your your consultation process a little bit more uh, uh, representative or or, or consul consultative with the um, you know, with the, with people who may be affected? J Jason, do you want me to take that one? Yeah, go ahead, please. So um, I I think. Um, I can't speak for the, the telecom industry. Um, we, for the process, as we understand it, it's been set by, by ISED. So I think, um, <clears throat> I think there is um, a capability or, or um, opportunity perhaps that um, maybe it's something that could be built into your tower siting policy is, I. I is you know if and when um, companies are coming to your area looking for proposed sites um, that they reach out to the municipality first to see if there's municipal lands available um, possibly and have the conversation. You, your staff, I'm sure, have a, a, a wealth of information about um, areas that would be, um, you know, preferred, perhaps. Um, I think it's, in some instances, it's a real challenge to find a willing landlord um, to host the towers as well. And again, in our process, because those towers are, um, uh, are, are dependent on one another, it, it makes a, a difference. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a small radius as to where that tower can go. They, they have specific areas. So it's, it's a challenge. Um, and I think, I think uh, and again, this is my own opinion. It's not necessarily EORNs or, or Rogers or their, or their uh, teams, but you could spend years um, talking about different sites before you ever signed a contract with anyone um, because in one, in one spot, you're gonna have people that may not be in favor. And if you looked at another spot, 
you could have that same type of reaction from neighbors there. So it's often challenging to find uh, property. And I'll let Jason um, add to that if he'd like. Yeah, no, and I, thanks, Lisa. Um, and I do think part of the issue or concern from a telco perspective is to meet that coverage. There's certain limitations on where towers would need to be placed in order to meet that coverage because you're your coverage space is only so large. So for them to optimize this to meet our targets of 99%, it is limited on, on where you can place those towers. There may be an opportunity, I agree, for discussion prior to with the municipalities to understand the temperature in the, uh, in the municipality. Mm -hmm. um, but I think from a telco perspective in meeting the overall objectives, it is fairly limited on where they can place these towers. Um, some of the other challenges we have seen as well is um, cost to provide hydro or telecommunications, whether it be fiber or copper into some of these locations can be very high. We've run into a number of challenges as well with, uh, with the Canadian Shield where it's solid granite. So you're limited on where you can build in some of that space as well. Uh, challenges or we're well aware of limitations near waterways um, and those types of things. So these are, are items that are taken into account by the telcos. Uh, that really does limit some of their ability on where they can place these within a municipality. Okay, hey, thank you, um, Jason and Lisa, for that. Also, what was going through my mind with that is that this is a, it is a business transaction. It's a real estate transaction. It's a signed lease, and there's confidentiality. When I mean, if I was a business, not a cell tower, and I was looking at three properties to do my business, uh, I'm not going to announce where it is until I sign that lease with the, where I want to place the business. Um, so, you know, I think we have to understand that and respect that. And I do know that, um, uh, and we're going to have that delegation after, uh, and they, they may be able to answer that for Rogers. They have definitely contacted our municipal staff. We're, we have very limited uh, Dysart owned land, no crown land, and very limited Dysart owned land. So, um, I would suspect that most of the locations that they're looking at are on private property and there's got to be some kind of confidentiality until a lease is signed in that regard. There's another question from Councillor Smith and then uh, hopefully we'll get to our next delegation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Lisa. I had a question just uh, following up to, uh, to your observations. You mentioned the, uh, the important part that the uh, municipality plays in the process and, uh, and the critical nature of uh, policies. In fact, you, you referenced that Dysart has a policy. Some uh, municipalities don't. I was curious if, uh, if during the uh, competitive bid processes you put together a, uh, you know, request for proposals and uh, negotiated with Rogers for quite some time and uh, eventually awarded them that contract back in March of uh, 2021. Um, and all during all of that time uh, together uh, with them and other vendors even, did you, did you reference ever the, uh, the importance of the municipality uh, in the approval process and the existence of uh, policies across municipalities that it would be important for Rogers to, uh, to respect? So I think for for EORN, um, <clears throat> I think for us, uh, we've always um, stressed um, the importance of, we're doing this for municipalities, for residents of Eastern Ontario. Um, I think that, that has been made very clear that the relationship um, with our municipalities are, are very important to EORN. Um, and 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 need to be respected. I don't think we've. Um, uh, I I think because we um, and again, this is myself speaking. Um, I feel that we um, we work for the municipalities in a way. Um, so um, I, I think we've been very clear and strong uh, with all of the. Um, well, so we had two. Uh, bids for the for the project. Uh, one was was Bell, and that's public information, and the other was Rogers. Um, I th I think we've made it very clear to to the Rogers team how important our municipalities are to Eastern Ontario, and 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 the um, desire uh, for EORN um, that um, municipalities um, are are respected and um, and that that they um, are heard. I don't know if Jason wants to add anything to that. No, I think you've, you've covered that. Yeah. We're well aware and we are in our meetings with Rogers or if there's discussions with other telcos, we are strongly supporting the municipalities that they should be working within them and be aware of what those guidelines are. Because there are differences between municipalities. 
So um, we are a strong promoter in that as well. Okay. There's there's no reason you, from your point of view then. Kept, when you want to speak, just put your hand up again because I did have another counselor after you. So is it a follow up? Yes, it is. Okay. Just just uh, then as a conclude as kind of summary, there'd be no reason for Rogers not to have looked carefully at our policies, and uh, and from your point of view, no reason for them not to uh, uh, work hard to comply with uh, the provisions of our policies. So again, um, the, the policies that are in place, um, we encourage um, municipalities to create their own tower siting um, guides or, or bylaws. Um, <clears throat> and we encourage that we've created a document to assist with that, uh, that we have sent out to municipalities. So um, from our understanding, um, it's a requirement um, as well by the federal government that if there is a policy in place um, at the municipal level that um, the, um, the uh, proponent uh, needs to work with the municipality to ensure that they, um, that they follow um, the guidelines um, put out in that policy. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I do have one more question from uh, Councillor Donaldson, and then I'd like to get to the next delegation because I think that'll help uh, some of the concerns and questions in terms of location, et cetera. Go ahead, Councillor Donaldson. Hi, I just have a quick question. Uh, you said in the presentation that uh, March 14th, there's six towers already started out of 265 in Halliburton County. I just want to know if you know how many are out of that 265 are planned for Dysart. I'd have to go back to our technical team. I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. There are six, uh, I just wanna clarify, there aren't six being built right now in, in Halliburton, that six um, in the region um, have been started. So actually um, the majority of those are in Stormont, Dundas and Glengarry uh, County is, um, and I think Prescott Russell. Um, and we have a couple started in the Prince Edward County area. Um, so uh, there are there have been no builds yet um, in in Halliburton, but we can go back. I can uh, we can ask our technical director to tell us how many um, proposed towers for um, for the municipality proper, and we can provide that information back to the clerk and the CAO. Okay, um, thank you, Lisa. And I actually. Um, obviously none in Dysart. This is the first one under this project of new towers. Uh, and uh, in our next delegation, they'll be able to answer, but we, I do know that there's one approved in um, Algonquin Highlands uh, and many more uh, within Halliburton County coming forward. This is, this is, they're all coming forward now with this, uh, with, with the concurrence. Um, so with that, I'd like to, uh, hopefully you can stay on Lisa. I understand if we just, just hit leave meeting at uh, 9.55 or whenever you need to get going. And I'm gonna ask, um, if we can bring in uh, Christian Lee and Eric Bell Chamber, who we met uh, last month, and they'll I, walk I just us through. I'd like to thank Council again. Thank you for having us. Okay, you're. And sorry, I've got something from. Oh, I do have a uh, mover. Yes, thanks, Mallory. She keeps me on track. I do need a mover and a seconder to re uh, receive the presentation from you. Okay, um, Councillor Wood Roberts, and seconded by Councillor Clark. Be resolved that Council acknowledges receive the presentation from Eastern Ontario Regional Network representatives regarding EORN cell gap project. All in favor? Okay, thanks very much. I should just point out too, Lisa, uh, you were in uh, person. Uh, no, was it yourself or is, who, uh, at the county? Uh, that was Heather Rightly and Jim yeah, Heather, there. That's yeah. right. And, and Mike Rutter, our CAO is um, co-chair, is that his title? He is the co-chair for, he is one of the uh, co-leads. So we have three um, EOWC CAOs who are our liaison um, between uh, the, the CAO working group. And so Mike is one of our co-leads on our project. Yes, and we also have um, Mayor DeVolan sitting as a as an EORN um, rep. So we, we, we've been pushing for this in Halliburton County for some time. Oh, okay. absolutely big supporters. So thank you. Yeah. So um, uh, looks like the presentation is up and um, are our delegates on <laughs> screen? Just looking to see is, uh, sorry, because I'm looking at the screen. Yeah, I think Eric right? is uh, Eric is sharing the screen, so you won't see. Excellent. Him. Okay. Okay. So good morning, Christian and Eric. Take it away. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, nice to be with you again this morning. Thanks for uh, allowing us a little bit of time. Uh, Eric's going to be driving the presentation. Uh, I'll walk through um, just some uh, quick slides that provide a little bit more overview um, of this specific site along uh, Glamorgan Road, answers uh, a few questions that came up at the last meeting. Uh, and then finally, we'll have some more uh, Q&A uh, if there are outstanding questions. Um, so obviously as a follow-up from the 25th of last month, um, we wanted to pro provide a little bit more uh, context and information regarding uh, the proposed tower. Oh, I think you just somehow muted. We lost your audio. Sorry, Christian, I can't hear you. Is there something at our end? Yo, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, you know what? My headphones died. And then oh, oh, yeah, really got to charge them up, yeah. huh? Okay, go old so school. If you can still hear me, I'll continue. Um, so one of the things we wanted to uh, touch on quickly was just to clarify the difference uh, in tower siting with these EORN specific uh, project sites versus our traditional network tower siting or how uh, Bell or, or TELUS or any other uh, carrier might site towers. Because um, it, it needs to be seen a little bit differently, we think, and uh, it might help understand um, why we're, we're pretty limited in terms of uh, where we're proposing certain towers. So um, in a traditional network context, if um, a, a company like Rogers were looking to improve uh, wireless service in a specific area, for instance, uh, the area just south of Halliburton, um, we'd have a, a few different opportunities to, to be flexible in terms of where we might put a tower, uh, the height of the tower, the location, so on, um, and still be able to achieve that objective just in terms of like how antennas are pointed and whatnot. Um, it's a little bit different with EORN because it's not what we're not, what we're proposing isn't one tower to service a specific area. This is, as, as Lisa mentioned, uh, one piece of a 550 or 600 piece puzzle. Uh, so if you picture a jigsaw puzzle, each one of those pieces has to be very specifically interconnected. And you know, while um, I know there was a, a suggestion to, uh, to put this tower somewhere around four kilometers south instead, while it doesn't uh, seem on the face of it like that big of a difference, that actually does create uh, quite a significant gap uh, looking at the overall uh, project in general. So um, I'll show a little bit more uh, specifically what we were asked to work within in terms of uh, our search for a willing property owner. Um, and then you can kind of see the, the kind of constraints that, that come with, with a project like this. Um, so we'll identify the properties uh, that uh, were considered when we, we first started looking uh, for a will, willing property owner. Um, we want to show that um, or how what we're proposing here is consistent with uh, other existing tower sites in the Dysart area um, and Halliburton County, as well as uh, it being consistent with uh, other EORN sites that have already been approved and are underway in neighboring municipalities. And we'll provide some examples. And then finally, like I said, uh, we'll answer any additional questions um, as they come up. So next slide. So um, as Lisa mentioned, uh, most of the towers within the Euron project are uh, proposed at 90 meters. And uh, like I said, this is uh, one piece in a 600 piece puzzle you know, to, to create that, that overall or to achieve that overall objective. Um, any sort of deviation we have of uh, a specific target area will create an overlap on one side and then a, a gap on the other side. So it's certainly less than ideal. Um, and like I mentioned, this differs quite a bit from the traditional approach of tower siting. So if you look at the image um, that's on this slide, this is the search area that was provided uh, to uh, the real estate vertical teams that Lisa referenced um, from EORN planning and Rogers network engineering planning. Um, the red circle being uh, the, that kind of target area that we want to work with. So here is the same uh, search area uh, with 
showing the property parcels in the area just to get an idea of really how limited uh, the search area is. Um, we evaluated uh, the properties within the search area that made sense. I mean, some properties obviously just aren't uh, of adequate size to house a 90 meter tower. So we're pretty limited in terms of a parcel that can accommodate such a thing. Um, and also, uh, you know, few that are outside the search area, but close to it. And as well showing uh, the subject property that we're actually uh, pushing forward. So um, the, the property uh, parcels with the red X's um, are either situations where the land conditions just aren't suitable for building a tower. Um, we do know there's a little bit of wetland in the area, so it's obviously uh, a non-starter to build uh, to build a giant structure on. Um, either that or there was no lack, there was no response from the landowner, or in some cases, um, we did make contact with landowners, but they, they just weren't interested in, uh, in uh, signing a lease with us. So um, the great news um, for this particular one is we were able to find uh, a willing property owner, uh, and it's the parcel that was smack dab in the center of our search area. So we felt um, that was a, an ideal candidate to move forward. So here, I know the uh, policy 38 in DISART uh, makes certain recommendations. One of the recommendations is that towers be set back uh, one kilometer from nearby residences. Um, without flipping back to the last side slide, you can see that within that fairly prescriptive search area, there just isn't an opportunity to have that kind of a setback. A kilometer uh, all the way around is a, is a very sizable buffer. Um, and it's, it's very consistent with um, other towers in the area. So throughout the county and throughout Dysart, there are many examples of existing towers that are uh, well within one kilometer of residence. So that was one example on the screen. Uh, there are four more here. The, the yellow radius is showing that one kilometer and you can see that uh, there, there are many situations with towers as high as 135 meters um, with uh, dozens of, of residential properties nearby. And also outside of um, the county and outside of Dysart, we've got some examples um, that were recently approved ERN project sites. Um, for instance, this 90 meter uh, guy tower in South Frontenac near Bob's Lake and uh, another handful here. And this is all, uh, the examples are in the, um, the PowerPoint that was shared. So I'm not sure how well you can, you can make it out on the screen here, but you should have copies of this as well. So. Mm -hmm. Um, what we're proposing, we feel, certainly isn't um, outside of outside of what's typically uh, been acceptable in the past. It's consistent with what's acceptable um, in other neighboring municipalities. Um, and and like we said, the you know while we we absolutely um, want to um, adhere to the policy, the policy is there for a reason, and, and work with the municipality. Um, it, our understanding reading the policy is that that one kilometer radius is a, is a recommendation like a when possible. Um, and it's, in most cases, it's, it's very, very challenging, if not impossible to meet that standard. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it. We just wanted to, to add that extra layer of context um, to this. Well, yeah, that's great. And if, if you want to unshare and then we can, um, I can see you a little bit better. Um, you know, thank you for bringing that new information back because those were some of the questions asked in terms of, um, uh, you know, clearly uh, that, that slide that shows the red circle in your search area, three properties. Um, basically, you didn't have a whole lot of choices in, in terms of, you know, to meet our policy. There wasn't like 10 property owners that you could have approached. Um, so uh, I will open it up to the floor. Keep in mind of our time limits on, on talking. So uh, we'll, we'll see where we go with that. So I do see Councillor Clark first. <clears throat> Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank, thank you for that, uh, Chris. Uh, you know, it would have been nice to see some of that information up front because it's, I think as you're well aware, the, uh, um, this is areas of concern for many of the people in the neighborhood where the towers are gonna to be located. Um, one of our principles of planning in, in, uh, in, in the Northern communities is the first principle is to maintain a natural environment and that's why people move to the area. So we want to listen as, as much as we can to neighbors. Um, you brought a little bit new light to this and, and based on this, I think there is a need for some uh, 
updating on the policy that we're using. Um, if I could suggest anything, um, you know, add a little bit more stringency or, or a little bit more um, detail to your consultative process when you are talking to people uh, or talking or in, in your consultation process. Um, I guess my my recommendation there is is rather than trying to deal with it with one meeting, it's always good to be able to take some questions away and then be able to come back and then answer the answer some of the specific concerns. I think would have may have addressed some of the uh, the issues, but. Uh, um, anyways, but thank you very much for adding the additional detail here. It, it, it makes more sense in terms of us trying to represent our, our neighborhood communities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, yeah, add, adding to that information, I really appreciate the analogy of a 500 piece puzzle. I love to do puzzles myself and goodness gracious, if there was one piece missing, it would just drive me crazy. So, um, and, and it, it doesn't, it isn't just a, a one tower sitting feeding this specific area. This is a whole network system. This is something different. So um, so I appreciated that that comment as well. Uh, Councillor Smith, go ahead next. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm curious uh, if, if the uh, the chart that showed uh, uh, six X's on it and the, and the one star in terms of the uh, proposed tower location, um, uh, you know, uh, our policy um, is, uh, pretty specific. I mean, our, our official plan indicates that uh, uh, towers will only be considered under the provisions of policy 38 and policy 38 uh, um, has some, uh, you know, I'll call them flexible statements in terms of generally we don't want towers within one kilometer of residence that provides some flexibility. Um, it talks about monotine towers and so forth again uh, being preferred. Um, there's some flexibility. Um, it has some requirements. And, um, and among those requirements is that the proponent uh, present uh, a number of alternative sites that they considered and um, an analysis uh, of uh, why the, uh, the requested site is the best. And, um, um, and so uh, I might have thought that there would be uh, some analysis shared with council with the public um, that uh, that compared these sites and uh, and why you came back with the one with the single one with the star on it um, and um, you know uh, uh, to me I, I mean I have no problem with 5G uh, from a health point of view I think it's it's been approved uh, um, I, I certainly agree that technology uh, needs to be deployed uh, to support uh, cell coverage for emergency purposes and all the other reasons that people want to use it. Um, but as a uh, member of council, I think it's important that we comply with the, uh, the official plan, the policies that we've put in place and the expectations that we've created amongst our residents, um, you know, before we approve anything. So, uh, so I'm still waiting for that analysis that said, hey, whether you do it by numeric scoring or some other system that says, here's why we ended up with this one star and, uh, and the other six X's turned out to, to be not as good. Okay, go ahead, Eric. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Our interpretation of policy 38 uh, is that we are to identify why existing sites weren't possible. The paragraph in the policy is in the co-location section, and it specifically says that if a tower option is considered to be the only viable option, then the proponent is to submit an analysis of other possible sites and why uh, those sites were not acceptable. We deem that to be existing sites because it's in the co-location paragraph. We identified exactly where the nearest sites were and how we're already co-located on them and how this tower is the only option. So we feel strongly that we've complied with policy 38 in that particular section. We're not in a position as a proponent to uh, sign six different leases with different landlords and survey six different sites and offer six different candidates to choose uh, from a municipal point of view. It's simply, we have a search area. We do our best to find a candidate that will uh, serve our objectives and, and meet our coverage objectives and the Eastern Ontario Regional Network uh, you know, project. Um, it's, it's, a, it's something where we can't simply offer a whole host of candidates. It's here's one with a willing landlord. We invest significant time and resources to then start the municipal consultation process uh, with a candidate that is being presented. 
Thank you for that response. Um, are there any other questions for Eric or Christian at this time? I did, uh, Councillor Smith, just one sec, as I'm speaking, uh, I, I, you can speak again. I do just wanna point out that um, some procedural uh, information. First of all, we do have two letters later in our agenda, which are only to be received. Uh, we're not gonna be discussing them, but they are. we do have motions to receive them. So I hope councillors read both the letters um, from Michael Butts and from, um, oh gosh, I believe it's Alex Smith. Sorry if I got the name wrong. Uh, so um, they are later in our agenda. So we're not throwing them on the floor to discuss, but they were there for us to read. They're there part of the public uh, information. As well as I, I, I asked um, our clerk, because there is some thought that once a, a motion has been moved um, and defeated that it can't be brought forward. But uh, Dysart follows Robert's rules of order. And so um, we are able to renew a motion uh, and Rogers has requested for concurrence. So I, I'm we'll still open it up to the floor for further questions, but I do wanna say that um, I will be looking to see if there is someone who wants to move that we would renew the motion of concurrence. So with that said, I do have Councillor Smith and then Councillor Wood Roberts and then Councillor Donaldson. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to uh, to respond to, uh, I think it was Chris or Eric. No, I've forgotten which one uh, it would be. Chris, Eric. was it Eric? Which, whichever. That made the comment about our policy 38 and and, uh, and this uh, section applying only to co-location. Um, that's uh, an interpretation that I find puzzling. Um, the requirement for that analysis is under a, a subtitle uh, called submission requirements. Um, and it doesn't say anything about co-location uh, in that section uh, whatsoever. So uh, it, it, it's pretty clear the proponent shall submit to the director of planning and development, one hard copy, one electronic copy, blah, 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 okay. describing A to F and in F written documentation, um, you know, uh, and, um, and so if there's going to be, uh, you know, additional of these requests, I, I think uh, you might want to, uh, uh, have someone else uh, review the policy and uh, and make sure that you're uh, you're going to meet it. You know that's all under a, t a major title called administration of policy. So um, I just can't see how you've uh, you know reached the interpretation that you have, and uh, and and to me that's a concern because it's uh, to me it's a, an important obligation of council that we uh, adhere to our official plan. Uh, you know that was developed with lots of public consultation. It's important that we comply with our policies. The uh, people at EORN talked about uh, the importance of those policies. And, uh, um, and so uh, just as we expect um, all of the residents and property owners of our community to obey the, uh, the bylaws and the rules that we put in place. Um, and to me, I think it's important that we, we demand the same of, uh, of those that uh, you know, want to uh, put infrastructure in our community. Thank you. Okay, and I did see Eric had his hand up, but I mean, could the analysis be as something as simple as we didn't have a willing landlord that we had? This is this is the location in the whole search area. This is a location where we have a willing landlord and like full stop one sentence. Go ahead, Eric. So we did go through the submission process with Jeff Isles, the director of planning, and there were certain parts of our submission that required additional information. And it was a very thorough review on on his part. Uh, this was not flagged as an issue. We provided the site selection and justification report that identified the existing towers in the uh, in the area and how co-location wasn't possible. And that satisfies section F of that policy. Thank you. Uh, on to Councillor Wood Roberts. Okay, perfect. So to Councillor Donaldson. Yeah, I just have a quick question on um... The links um, for this tower, um, it says that it's 8.8 .8 kilometers from an existing bell tower. Um, so is that what this proposed tower is going to link to on one side, but um, what about the other side? Like how are the links working since we have no towers started yet? So through Madam Mayor, the transmission between sites in this instance will happen by a microwave dish. Uh, likely a three foot circular microwave dish to tie into the closest uh, adjacent site uh, that can be seen and that uh, our transmission uh, department deems to be uh, acceptable for this site. 
that satisfy you? No. Okay. Yes, back to Councillor Wood Roberts. I have a general question, yep. a little bit for Barbara, a little bit for yourself, Madam Mayor. Um, the county committed $441,000 to this project. Dyser's portion is over $165,000. Um, and it's more of a comment than a question. So we did make a commitment. We also made a commitment for a strategic plan. And all of those pillars, our third pillar on our strategic plan said expand access to broadband. So this is, this is fitting in with our strategic plan, right? I'm interpreting that appropriately. And we've already contributed a good amount of money into the ERON project. So where the money came from is um, because we're in a two tier municipal system, right. one taxpayer, the taxpayers of Dysart when they pay their bill, the portion that goes to the county. So, so it didn't come out of like, it didn't flow in and out of uh, this office, uh, but it definitely uh, Dysart residents are just shy of 40% of the population of the Halliburton County. So 40%, you've already done your math <laughs> of 441,000 of tax. So yes, Dysart taxpayers have, have committed that much. Um, any further comments or questions? If not, I will be going back to seeing if there's someone to move to renew the motion. Uh, Deputy Mayor Kennedy? You would like to move yeah, I'll to move that we renew. renew a motion. Yes. Um, Mallory, I do believe you had, or, or through Jeff, had two resolutions ready. So you'd like to remove the, excuse me, not remove, renew the motion for concurrence. Is there a seconder for that? Councillor McKechnie. Um, so Mallory, do you want to read that out for me, if you don't mind? Um, so be it resolved that council concurs with the proposed telecommunications tower on Minnick Lake Road, site C8506, civic address 341, no, sorry, 3470 Morgan Road. A 30 meter vegetation buffer should be maintained around the proposed tower and lighting shall be the minimum required to meet safety standards. The access road is to be designed and screened with vegetation to minimize the visual impact of the tower by immediate neighbors. During construction, proper site pre pre preparation and construction methods are to be used to prevent sedimentation of the adjacent stream. The proponent must obtain an entrance permit before constructing the access road. This resolution confirms that the consultation process completed by Rogers Communications met the requirements of the municipality's special policy number 38. Okay, so the motion has been read, and I think in light of uh, last month's meeting, I'm going to uh, call for a recorded vote. So, Mallory, if you can go through the through that. All right, uh, Councillor Clark. Support. Oh, microphone. Support. Yeah, support. Councillor Donaldson. No. Microphone. No. Deputy Mayor Kennedy. Yes. Councillor McKechnie? Yes. Councillor Smith? Uh, no. Councillor Wood Roberts? Yes. And Mayor Roberts? Yes. Okay, so that carries. So that carries. So um, we will be sending a letter of concurrence. Thank you for uh, staying on the screen. Uh, Jason, um, appreciate that. And also to Eric and um, Christian. In light of, while well, we still have staff on the screen and in light of all the discussion over policy 38, I don't know if this is the appropriate time or if we should do it as notice of motion at the end of the meeting, Mallory, you can let me know. I do think policy 38 should have a review in light of the EORN project and references to things like monopines and um, distance. And maybe we really need to, you know, Clean up the language. So I, I don't, I see lots of nods at this head, but I don't know if this is the off place to do that. Mallory? I think, I think to keep concurrence clean uh, rather than adding to this resolution, that it should be a notice of motion separately at the end of the meeting. No, that's what I was thinking. I didn't know if I could do a motion from the floor right now because we're discussing this. So uh, hold that. Don't let me adjourn the meeting without making that notice of motion. I'll make a note of it. Oh, there we go. So there's another one coming. So there'll be two notice of motions. Okay, so that did carry. Thank you everybody for staying on the screen and um, we'll move along with the rest of our meeting. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm just going to make a note of that as we, uh, so I don't forget. Okay, so next we're going to adjourn our regular meeting of council to proceed into a public meeting. So I do need a mover and seconder for that, Councillor Wood Roberts, and seconded by Councillor Clark. Here it was told that council hereby adjourns the regular meeting of council at 10.04 a.m. to proceed into a public meeting to consider zoning bylaw amendment application D14 ZB 2022 005 Lands of Kirby. All in favor? Okay, so that's carried. So we're now in the public meeting and we'll be bringing in um, two delegates, but I'm just going to read uh, the preamble for our public meeting. This is a uh, purpose of a public meeting is to present planning applications in a planning forum as required by the Planning Act. This is a public meeting to consider one proposed zoning amendment to the Dysart et al. Zoning Bylaw 2005-120. During the public meeting, Council will consider all information available regarding the proposed amendment, review the staff report, which includes any public comments received to date, and listen to all comments provided during the meeting. Uh, this is a returning file, so um, I'm just going to make note uh, in terms of the process. Just one minute. Uh, and I don't know other than, yeah, Sue Harrison and Jesse Kirby who have registered to speak, and I don't believe there's any other written comments, but the Planning Act does specify that if a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the municipality of Dysart et al. before the proposed bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the municipality to the local appeal tribunal and may not be added as a party to an appeal unless, in the opinion of the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. Um, and I also forgot all persons who have given the municipality written notice that they would like to receive notice of the decision will receive a copy of the decision and you must make this writing a request in writing rather to the municipality. <clears throat> so I am going to turn it over to uh, is Chris Orson joining us. Good morning Chris is expected to join us um, has he been invited to join us. He's coming he's actually he's coming right now yeah <laughs> okay. Because we are like right on time. I just wanted to point that out. It's very hard to keep these things to judge how long other things will take. Uh, so uh, I usually will let Chris review the file and there he is. Okay, Chris. So I'll uh, turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, this is for file uh, D14 ZB 2022-005, Lands of Kirby. This is a returning file. Uh, during the May 24th, 2022 uh, public meeting, and through the public comments received, uh, Council had deferred the, the proposed zoning bylaw 2022-59 and directed the applicant to revise the proposed plan in order to implement further mitigation measures between the rural residential and environmental protection areas as identified in the EIS. Staff have now received the updated plan from the applicant, which incorporates the 20 meter buffer um, uh, sorry, the 20 meter buffer surrounding the rural residential uh, zone located on the subject property. The plans and schedules are included with the report. The proposal is generally consistent with the provincial policy, generally conforms to the municipal official plan. And if council is satisfied with the proposed update change, uh, the resolution as provided at the top of the report may be appropriate and staff also include that uh, no additional comments have been received uh, from um, those who provided uh, comments at the 20 at the May 24th 2022 meeting um, and the consultant is also in attendance to address any questions that council may have. Okay so maybe I'll, I will turn it over to um, Sue on behalf of, so we, you know we have I don't know whoever wants to speak Sue did you want to speak to the um, amendments made and then Jesse if you had anything to add so go ahead Sue. Uh, thank you. Uh uh, Mayor Roberts and Council. Um, yes, we made the revision. We've added the 20 meter buffer uh, to further protect um, the environmental uh, protection zone. Um, we were asked to do a site evaluation report, um, a wildlands fire risk management report, and a planning justification report. And all of those documents were supportive of this change. Uh, we are merely refining the boundary of the environmental protection zone based on ground truthing done by Mikelski um, Nielsen. Um, 
and we are implementing all the recommendations of those reports and the mitigation measures. And we agree that uh, we ask council to support the change. Okay, um, any questions, comments from council? Councillor Smith? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, the additional uh, work on this and uh, uh, creating that uh, 20 meter buffer. I'm, I'm curious, uh, as to exactly what that buffer means in terms of, uh, of use of the area for uh, uh, backyard hens or non-native uh, creatures, uh, 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 dumping of manure and so forth. Would, uh, would it be acceptable to, uh, to keep uh, those, uh, um, uh, I'll call them farm animals, uh, in the uh, buffer area or would it be acceptable to dump manure in that uh, buffer area? I don't know who wants to answer that. Our planning staff do or? <laughs> sure, uh, staff can answer that. Um, yeah, thank you. The, the use would not be permitted within the EP area. So uh, those buffer areas would be considered the EP area and therefore wouldn't um, permit those uses in there. The uses would be permitted um, on the RR zoned um, portions of the, the lands. Sue, did you want to add to that? Oh, Jeff does too, but oh, sorry, I've asked for Sue first and Jeff, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I agree with Chris. Um, the EP buffer or the EP zone, there are no structures allowed and the idea is there's no development. Um, where the backyard hens, et cetera, uses are allowed, are specifically allowed in the RR-5 uh, zone, the rural residential, and uh, they would be subject to all the setbacks and requirements of that zone. Okay. Um, Jeff, did you wanna add something different to there? Yes, thank you. Um, and I just want to clarify for Council, uh, I know Councillor Smith used the term backyard hen. So if you look at our, our zoning bylaw, when those provisions were put in place, the backyard hen provisions apply mostly to the suburban residential and urban residential areas. This property is uh, zoned rural residential and has an exception zone, but it does permit a hobby farm. So those hobby farms uh, permit uh, different animals, including hens, but not backyard hens. So um, they can have uh, livestock and grow crops for personal consumption and, and, uh, and personal use. So as long as it's not for commercial uh, purposes. Okay, thanks for uh, clarifying that. Any further questions, follow up for Councillor Smith? Yep, thanks, thanks Jeff, and I appreciate the uh, responses there. Uh, one other question, uh, um, you know, the report notes that uh, um, there were uh, several uh, zoning compliance issues uh, with this property that were reviewed at the uh, May public meeting. Um, and uh, the bylaw officer has uh, visited uh, or contacted the owner, um, but there's no evidence that has been brought into compliance yet. Um, so if that's true, I was wondering why the file is back here prior to being brought into compliance because normally we've uh you know with different shoreline activities we've insisted that you know a, a non-compliant structure be brought in to compliance i.e removed uh before we uh you know finalize uh, passing of the bylaws so i was i was curious as to the sequence of events here thank you uh well i i mean jeff you might answer that but i would think that our bylaw department is working through those issues and would continue to do so they are they do their job and the planning department do their job and then one isn't contingent on the other passing a zoning bylaw is not contingent on like th there's other tools for the bylaw officer to follow through with that so and and they will be that's what that's his job their job but that's sorry and that, that is correct um these are the, there will be separate processes staff uh, through the process, uh, planning staff will flag these these issues and um, we'll provide them to the uh, bylaw department where then they follow up. And um, if they do not bring it to compliance, then that becomes an enforcement uh, matter. And um, so therefore they are sort of, they sort of branch off into separate uh, processes at that point. Okay, so um, is there a mover and seconder to move this forward then? Councillor Clark and Deputy Mayor Kennedy. Here is all the report for file number D14ZB2022-005 Kirby, which consists of lot 25 concession eight. I, I'm in the middle of reading this and realize the applicant's on screen. Did you want to add anything? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to move this meeting too fast. If there was something you wanted to add and didn't get to say. No, no, I, so I did uh, speak to the, the bylaw 
um, officer, they reached out to me um, for the first time to talk about this a couple of weeks ago, but I, I was in Europe. Um, I just got back this weekend. Um, and so we are discussing kind of cleaning up the property and getting it uh, all ready to go for the zoning. Okay, well, and thank you. Like we said, that's a separate issue, but I, I'm just partway reading it and, and realizing that it is a public meeting, so you are entitled to speak as well as the applicant. Okay, I was at concession eight, part one, plan 19R-5745 in the geographic township of Dysart, municipality of Dysart et al. Be received for information and that council direct staff Direct, sorry, a draft bylaw to be brought forward for consideration during its August 23rd, 2022 regular meeting and the council recommends approval of proposed bylaw 2022-59. All in favor? Okay, so that's carried. And that concludes our public meeting. Uh, so I need a motion to adjourn. Okay, from Councillor Wood-Roberts and Councillor Donaldson. Is there anything else? Okay, <laughs> sorry, it's hard to look up, look down. Be it resolved that council hereby adjourns the public meeting at 10 15 a.m. and reconvenes the regular meeting of council. All in favor? Okay, great. That carried. All right, thanks everybody. And we're back now in our regular council meeting. I'm just going to look uh, to see because we've had two delegations, lots of questions, comments. Do we want to take a 15 minute break now? Or do you want to go for 15 more minutes and go through the reports? Okay, we'll go through some reports. Um, anything in Harcourt that you wanted to speak to Councillor Donaldson? Don't forget your microphone. Uh, nope, there hasn't been any meeting since the last meeting. No meeting, okay, but anything happening in the, the um, community center there? Just the normal sewing, sewing club, okay. cards. Okay, I'll move on to uh, Councillor Smith for uh, West Guilford. Uh, thank you. Uh, our committee has not met since I re my report at the uh, July uh, council meeting, but I, I can to, uh, to your follow up uh, questions uh, let you know that the center is active. Uh, uh, continue to be uh, a number of uh, events and activities going on there. The uh, uh, the drop zone, the uh, uh, the family oriented program that runs on Friday night. They've uh, indicated they'd like to uh, continue in September. Uh, so. Uh, um, we're in the process of, of getting that uh, teed up for them. And um, uh, that's about it right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Clark, Reels in. Um, uh, yes, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, we, the, the gallery board has not met in August, but um, Lori, did, uh, Lori Jones did submit her, um, her uh, report. Um, she reported uh, that the Arts and Crafts Festival in July had an attendance of Pretty close to 4,500 people, it's very well attended. Uh, has some challenges with weather, but anyways, they were able to uh, work through that. Um, they're continuing with their Patio Tuesdays, uh, crafty events and ukuleles and all kinds of different things. So it's a good thing to go out and attend if you're looking for something for a Tuesday. Um, Art Squared is a, a program that supports local artists, uh, 12 by 12. And um, that's also a good fundraiser for the, uh, for the Real Sand Gallery. Um, that's continuing, and they've got a summer exhibit um, regarding, I guess, a, 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 a number of local artists dealing with some abstract stuff, and that runs until September the 3rd. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Great. I do have a, um, a motion to receive the report, if I could. For Councilman Keckney, Councilor Smith. It resulted that Council acknowledges received the August 2022 Rails and Gallery and Art Center report. All in favor? Carried. It's great that they were able to do uh, to do the Art and Craft uh, Festival. I know she said it was a, like a little bit smaller this year. Uh, it's so hard coming out of COVID, which we're not out of yet. But uh, you know, trying to pick up those events and, and things, um, it's it's hard. Uh, BIA, anything there? Uh, they had Midnight Madness. It was a, a reasonably good turnout for it. Um, a, many of the stores were open. Uh, not, not a lot of little kiosks like there has been in the past. But the uh, the dance, the new the new dance studio is um, getting organized, up and running, and it's a huge contribution to for the community. And they were they were part of Midnight Madness, and they had some good entertainment. The uh, summer flowers are actually thriving nicely this year. They're quite lovely. And I 
not sure if we have a meeting tonight or if it's next Tuesday. Okay. Check. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, that's great. I was at Midnight uh, Madness uh, selling beef on a bun in the um, in the dance studio. Kids were across the way, and yeah, it was still you know again just like I said about the Rails End Gallery. Report, you know, it's it's nice to see these things come back up, and sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but I think everybody appreciated that it was back on. So thanks to the BIA and um, for organizing that. The Echo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, Harvest Halliburton, I don't think you meet in the summer. No, we haven't. Yeah, we haven't had any formal meetings, but there are some in, informal discussions going on and going on what we're going to look like going forward. So that's still in process. Okay. Um, and uh, what's next? Source protection? Nope. No meetings. Um, Upper Trent? Nope. Um, however, did you want to? At some point, maybe not today. Did you want to speak to uh, what's happening at the county regarding uh, that? Uh, yeah, I can just in generalities. Um, uh, through the shoreline protection bylaw discussions over the last couple of years, there's been more and more talk and discussion about how that's a piece of a bigger puzzle. Being uh, uh, Muskoka Watershed Council came and spoke to us, and that piqued some interest at, at county council to investigate a similar type of a organization here. And uh, Councillor Moffat and myself. Uh, volunteered to to uh, start the process of at least trying to gather the interested parties and perhaps have a kind of a summit meeting um, to, to, to just to, to discuss further options going forward in the future. So it's very, very much its infantile stage. And uh, Councillor Moffat and I met last week and we we're hoping to, I believe the, the goal, our goal is to bring it to September uh, Committee of the Whole, but uh, that, uh, that may not happen, but uh, well, that's our, our goal we're trying to. Well, I appreciate you bringing that up because I think, um, sorry, I put you on the spot there, but I, I think it's important and, uh, you know, both yourself and Councillor Moffat are very passionate about that and maybe something that you can continue after your term of council because the Muskoka Watershed Council, when they came and did the presentation, um, you know, first we looked at our agenda and said, why are they on our agenda? Because, you know, like this teeny little spot in Halliburton County is affected by it up in Algonquin Islands, but um, the, the things that they do and the promotion of lake health and the uh, uh, revitalization programs that they have forward, it basically is the umbrella, I think as Councillor Moffat talked about, for all the other organizations working, you know, Environment Halliburton and the Coalition of the Equitable Water Flow. All, I'm, I'm not even gonna get the acronyms all correct, but there's so many people working, like this is their mandate, this is their mandate, this is their mandate, but to have something that's sort of overarching all of that, for Halliburton would be um, would be really great. So thanks for bringing that up. Uh, nothing on the uh, next two things. Uh, I believe we have a meeting for the uh, Climate Change Action Committee. Right. Yeah, there you go. We have a meeting Friday. I'm the county rep. Councillor Smith is the DICER rep. So that's good. Um, and so that's everything there. And so let's just do recommendations from the committee of the whole, and then maybe we will um, take a break after that. So. Anything, any questions or comments over that? Um, Mallory, I've got a, because one of the recommendations was the um, tax adjustments that's in here. That that was the only uh, thing that was recommended at a committee of the whole. So you can just pass a resolution that sounds like a regular resolution. That's why okay. it's that, yeah. That's why it's like that. Uh, yeah, so it's just two uh, for the uh, tax adjustments. So mover and a seconder on that. Councillor Smith, Councillor Clark. Here's all the council authorized tax adjustments for applications made under section 357 municipal act 2001 as amended as follows and the amounts are there all in favor okay so that's carried okay so let's call for a 15 minute recess it's uh 1025 we'll reconvene at 10 40. okay
Thank you. So Barbara, if you can unmute and uh, go through the reserve funds. Yes, good morning. So we have here a forecast for the reserves and the reserves fund policy. Uh, this was requested at the last council meeting of June or July 26, where uh, the balances were presented as of January 1, 2022. So in the accompanying schedule here, uh, we have a beginning balance on the total reserves of just over $8 million and transfers to the reserves during 2022 is forecasted at just uh, about 2.9 million and total uh, draws or transfers from the reserves is 2.2 million. So a net uh, increase on the reserves of um, $666,000. And that will round out the year at uh, just about 8.7 million in uh, reserve balance. So this forecast here is based on the municipal budget that's been passed by council, the 2022 budget, along with any other decisions that have been made throughout the year. Um, additionally, in the report, there is a column for commitments that have been uh, made for 2023. Um, so there's just one uh, duplication here. Uh, I've noticed after publishing the report under uh, buildings and facilities, the uh, construction of the ski club um, is actually included under the uh, draws for 2022. So. Um, the initial commitment actually is $320,000, which restates the total commitments for 2023 to $1,292,000. So you put the ski club in twice. That's right. Because it's out of this year's reserve, not 2023, Correct. which it has been started. Quite excited. I walked through there the other day. Um, so... When you say that this is what's forecast at 2022, keep in mind that uh, 2021's budget, we were underspent in some certain departments and we added those to reserves. So is that projected as if we come in on a balanced budget? Like what if, as an example, in a department where we thought we'd hire a staff, let's use public works, uh, and we've had that position vacant for some time, it's reposted. And so we have a surplus in certain departments uh, which we won't know until the year end. So that doesn't take into account those type of surpluses, correct? Correct. It does not take into account the uh, 2022 municipal operating final result. Exactly. So I, I'm using staffing, but it could be something like, uh, uh, I don't want to say it washouts with the rain that we're getting, but uh, you know, if, if we set us this much money for washouts and we only spent this much money, We'll look at where the target is for that. So, so depending on how we end up, it could even be more than what is projected, or I, I doubt doubt less. But uh, and then, so any any questions on some of these the funds and and you know uh, I do from uh, Councillor Smith first and then Deputy Mayor Kennedy. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Barbara, we've got you know uh, something north of eight million dollars here. Uh, um, cash, if you like. Uh, I know we have a little bit that we've uh, lent ourselves that uh, has been used for uh, uh, good purposes, but uh, how else is this uh, amount of money invested right now? As far as investments go, uh, it's either sitting in a savings account, a high interest savings account, or a general operating uh, account. So with... Uh, I know there are, you know, you can never forecast the future with complete certainty or accuracy, uh, but there are those that are saying that, uh, you know, the GIC rates that are available today are as, uh, are as good as they're going to get. Um, and um, <coughs> would it make sense to uh, uh, put some of these funds into, uh, um, you know, some GICs to earn a higher rate of return? Yeah, I, I mean, that is an option if council wishes to uh, go that direction. And it's also been mentioned in the past that uh, 
Um, we would look at uh, uh, investment vehicles when the investment policy is rewritten. That, that's a good point, Councillor Smith, because so that, this is sort of one side of it. And, and then, um, you know, there may be GICs that are very short term, but still getting better than savings accounts. But I do would think that this this isn't a decision that we can make at this table because that is a lame duck uh, decision of financial implication, I would think. Um, but certainly that would be something that I think uh, to the treasurer to bring forward to a new councils to have uh, to look at your you know investments on things when you know if something's you know going to be in locked in for at least a year why not have that in a GIC, Councillor Smith. Yeah, thanks. And well, it it uh, you know some of these funds um, <laughs> we can be pretty confident aren't even going to be required for a few years. Like mm -hmm. we we put away I, I recall it's fifty five or it could be sixty thousand dollars a year for our fire a new fire truck that we're probably eight years away from buying um and um and so uh you know uh gic's of five years today you can you can get about five percent on them that's certainly better than any uh high interest savings account and would be a you know good use for our taxpayers money yeah okay uh deputy mayor kennedy oh, yeah thanks um just clarification i think most of your targets are established through the asset management plan is that correct and then the other ones are more or less just arbitrary best practices? Um, yeah, so uh, uh, specifically uh, under the discretionary reserve funds, if you're looking at more uh, the specific classifications of assets, and you'll, you'll notice, for instance, buildings and facilities, that's directly tied to the asset management. Um, you'll notice uh, general vehicles is another classification in the asset management. So some of them are tied directly to asset management. Um, others, uh, if you're looking at, for instance, the winter maintenance reserve, um, that there uh, is looking at historical trends over the last uh, four or five years. So there are different criteria that... Um, uh, form the target balance. Supplement. Yep, yep, please. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. And I think that's an excellent tool for future councils to have some kind of guidance uh, going forward when we're looking at reserve money uh, transfers. I, I really applaud your department for doing this. And uh, uh, just a question here, the example, the Harbor property that we just sold, where would the proceeds for that go? Would that just go into working funds as a temporary spot or is it... Uh, yeah, so that was the actual sale of land and that initially went into the development reserve and that's been realigned amongst the discretionary reserve funds uh, amongst some of the key uh, asset classifications for asset uh, management and uh, namely it was allocated to uh, buildings and uh, vehicles and uh, fire vehicle and equipment. Okay, thank you. Okay, any further questions on that? And Mallory, am I correct that that would be lame duck to make any kind of investment strategy right now or actual investments? I don't think council if you're, if you're going to take on a liability or spend over 50 grand, it's kind yeah. of, yeah. But it's certainly something that a future council um, would, uh, and Barbara can keep that in mind and to, to be able to um, bring that forward. Councillor Smith? Well, I'm not sure buying a GIC is is taking on a liability or spending money. It's uh, it's an investment that uh, you know is guaranteed by uh, uh, the CDIC, and uh, um, you know, so waiting until uh, December is you know maybe not a wise decision. It, it's still uh, over the fifty thousand dollar threshold. And a new council might come in and want to spend all the reserves that we've just done. So I, I don't think that's why we're, I, I honestly don't think, I mean, it would be interpretation of what lame duck means and uh, we'd have to get clarification on that. If, if Well, I think, that, you know, the, the, the explanations have given to us in the past has been that it's a, uh, an expenditure that's outside of the budget, um, you know, or as Mallory said, taking on a liability, borrowing money. Um, um, so I don't, I don't understand why we, couldn't uh, request that the treasurer proceed in that direction, getting money out of a bank account that's probably paying less than 2%. Okay, so uh, with further direction and looking to the rest of council to see if they, do they want the treasurer to bring forward something when 
when time permits to look at uh, investment tools and if that's permitted in these next few months that we have left. Can, uh, Mallory, first. Um, sorry, I, I, I thought, Barbara, we were you already directed to bring back a new policy on this? Are we talking about something that's already been directed? <laughs> There's been no specific direction okay. on an investment policy. We have a current policy, however, it needs to be rewritten. And so that's something that would be forthcoming. Um, these types of policies do take time to write. There's a lot of background research and regulations and rules involved here. So, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it's going to take a bit of time um, to get the actual policy rewritten. And um, so, um, yeah. Uh. Yes, I think at this time, uh, probably just knowing that it was acknowledged that Barbara knew that this would be after the, this, these policies were um, adopted and the different reserve funds created, then the next step is the investment policy. And I don't think we can make knee-jerk reactions about, I mean, we can in our personal life to go and buy a GIC here and there, but I don't think this council in the last two months should be making quick decisions, even though they're guaranteed. I understand that. Uh, but I think knowing that the treasurer has that on her agenda uh, to come forward at a future time, just because these seats vacate council doesn't end. It just picks up where it lay, leaves off. So uh so that'll be a priority. We have two councillors here that will make sure that that continues. So for now, perhaps we'll just uh, receive the, uh, the receipt of this report. So that's Deputy Mayor Kennedy and Councillor McKechnie. Oops. Here it was all that council acknowledges receipt of the reserves and reserve fund forecast as information. All in favor? Okay, that's carried. And Next, under administration, we have the two letters that I referenced uh, when we were having our delegations this morning that I asked council to consider that I know that they had been read. So at this point, we're just receiving them for the public record. So I'll move in seconder, Councillor Wood Roberts, and seconded by Councillor McKechnie. Be result that council acknowledged just received a letter from Alex Smith, excuse me, Smith, expressing his support for a telecommunications tower on Minnecock Lake Road. All in favor? Okay. And secondly, mover and a seconder for the next letter, Councillor Clark and Councillor Smith. <coughs> Be resolved that council acknowledges receipt of the letter of concern from Michael Butts regarding the Minnecock Lake uh, Road tower proposal. All in favor? Okay, so it's carried. Okay, so now we'll move into planning. We'll bring our planners back. We have quite a bit in planning, <laughs> but hopefully it'll go pretty surprise, surprise. And that's not even half of what they could be bringing. We're like, where's this file? Where's that file? Get cracking. Work harder. Sorry, I'm being bunchy. Um, okay, so we do have our planners on board and uh, Chris, go ahead. Thank you. So this is for the lands of Kirby. Uh, staff don't have any further comments and uh, recommend <laughs> approval as outlined in the recommendation. Okay, we've already, oh, hi Sue again, we've already discussed this. So really I'm looking for a mover and a seconder. Councillor uh, Wood Roberts and Councillor Clark. Your result that bylaw 2022-59 being a bylaw to amend Bylaw 2005-120 for the lands of Kirby, known as Lot 25, Concession 8, Part 1, Plan 19R-5745 in the geographic township of Dysart, municipality of Dysart et al., which would change the zone on the subject property from rural residential-5 zone and environmental protection zone to rural residential-5 zone and environmental protection zone in order to redefine the environmental protection area and expand the developable area be read a first, second, third time pass sign and the corporate seal attached there too. All in favor? Okay, so that carries. Thanks, Sue. Bye, Sue. Thank you. Okay, so item B is an update to a site plan agreement. And I believe that's you, Chris, also. That's correct. Um, 
Thank you. This is for the Lands of Hops uh, bylaw 2022-82. Uh, as outlined in the planning report, the subject property had recently changed ownership. The site plan agreement uh, was not completed by the original owner and therefore requires a new owner to enter into the site plan agreement with the municipality. Due to the time that has passed, council can consider additional details be implemented into the proposed development um, or the site plan agreement through this process. Otherwise, should council consider the updated site plan agreement with 10 Hops Drive Inc., uh, the recommendations as outlined in the report may be appropriate. And staff are here to address any questions council may have. Okay, so you know we saw this two years ago. It's changed hands. The new owner is ready to put a shovel in the ground tomorrow, but that's not quite possible, but uh, as soon as possible. So I don't know if there's any further questions. We did have debate about this two years ago. So uh, Deputy Mayor Kennedy and Councillor Smith. Uh, yeah, um, just the updated site plan agreement. When I went to look at it, uh, it said I wasn't uh, didn't have a proper didn't have appropriate. Uh, uh, ability to look at it. So I just want to confirm that the updated site plan agreement is as you have attached. It, there's no real changes to it. I just I just want to make sure this deal goes through. Um, the, you know, my understanding would be that the seller to the new owner was based on already things that were passed by this council. So I have no issue with just carrying on with that. But, uh, just confirmation what your, your uh, recommendation is status quo, for lack of a better word. The site plan is the same as what we approve, what we approved, but didn't get signed because securities weren't received and it wasn't signed. So there's no change to the site plan. Is that correct, Chris? That's correct. And great question. Um, so it's just uh, essentially update, well, updating the site plan agreement only just for the um, the ownership uh, staff have not changed anything with the site plans or any other details in the site plan agreement. <coughs> okay. Um, okay. And next was Councillor Smith. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, a, uh, a couple of points that I'd, I'd like to uh, to raise. Uh, uh, first, the site plan agreement in uh, section 20.2 talks about a, an interest rate of 12% in overdue accounts. Um, almost all of our agreements now uh, have a 15% uh, charge, one and a quarter percent per month on overdue accounts. And if uh, you know somebody was building do well any other structure that doesn't require a site plan agreement that's what they'd be paying so um i'd like council to consider uh, changing the uh, section 20.2 to indicate that it would be one and a quarter percent 15 percent per annum on any overdue accounts um and and secondly uh, uh madam mayor as you alluded to there was uh kind of a uh, divided vote in fact if i recall correctly it was a four to three vote um where um we uh agreed with the uh, previous owner to uh, to have uh, what I'll call minimal uh, timber features on the uh, structure. Uh, staff had actually uh, recommended uh, that uh, there be more uh, required to, to kind of address this building up. I know it's only a, a dollar store, but it's a, you know, it is kind of on the main road coming into town uh, uh, from, uh, you know, from the uh, County 21 uh, direction. And, uh, um, and I think it would be nice if we uh, if we did uh, uh, request a um, you know uh, alignment with that staff recommendation and a little more timber feature so that it's uh, not just another dollar store if you know what I mean. Um, and uh, so again, I'd I'd ask uh, colleagues on council to uh, uh, reconsider that and see if we can have a vote go the other way, four to three or whatever this time. Thank you. Okay, so I, with that on the floor, I'm going to look to see, we do have this, the site plan agreement in our package, so there are, are there any councillors that want to, to see a, a change to that, essentially? Councillor Clark? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, they're taking over an existing contract, so I don't think we should change it or, or causing too much disruption of it, but it would not, it wouldn't be bad to advise the new owners that there had been discussion at the previous council meeting and desire for it to be dressed up to be more fitting with the, with the community. Not make it a requirement, but at least advise them that, you know, what, some, what the original council's uh, discussion was on this thing, if that's possible. Well, to Councillor Smith's point, there was a recorded vote, and uh, but it did pass as we see it here. So unless somebody two years later wants to change their mind, if uh, other businesses in the area were all similar, I would understand that if it was in the 
absolute main street, uh, you know, we'd be, I think our, our, our downtown core and our, the, that area are, are slightly different. In fact, even the BIA calls them area one and area two, we have different sign bylaws, et cetera, for that area. Um, so, you know, there's very little articulation on the existing buildings in and around them. So I, I, I'm, myself would vote the same way. Uh, this is just a name change as far as I'm concerned. And I see some nods. So I, I don't think there is support uh, for that, Councillor Smith. I've looked, I, I don't see support to change the site plan as presented. Well, as staff noted in their report here that it, given the passage of time and the potential change of ownership, that it, it was council's, uh, it was an opportunity, if you like, a council's right to make a change. And um, as I said, given it was a four to three vote last time and, uh, you know, I mean, this Dollarama is just going to be one more nail in the coffin of downtown with uh, another reason that people will say, I'm going to drive out of town and uh, shop out there and uh, and not uh, be in the core area. It is a new development. Some of the other buildings out in that area have been there for uh, decades. And um, and so I'm just hoping that our standards would rise for uh, new development. But uh, thank you. Well, I did take your request and I looked to the rest of council and I, I, and I'm, you know, with show of hands and nods, it's, I know for the public, it's hard to see on the screen, but I do, I, I haven't heard any verbal support or anyone put up their hand in terms of whether something like that development's a nail in the coffin to the downtown. I, you know, in my mind, it's development. That property has sat empty. I, I mean, the, the previous functioning um, property, business that was on that property I can't even remember how long ago they closed and moved um, so it's really just been luckily they're cutting the grass but it's it's, it's been vacant uh, property so I think uh, developing the property is is going to be good for the town it is part of the town uh, but anyway I didn't see support for that so really we're just changing the name securities are the same uh, the resolution was in a package then if there's no further questions is there a mover and a seconder bring this vote? Councillor Clark, Councillor McKechnie. We resolve that bylaw 2022-82 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of a site plan agreement with 10 Hops Drive Incorporated, legally known as concession eight to nine, part lot 12, registered plan 19R-1658, <clears throat> part one, in the geographic township of Dysart, municipality of Dysart et al. Be read a first, second and third time Passed, signed, and the corporate seal attached here too, subject to the following conditions. That a letter of credit be posted. Oh, pardon me. Councillor Smith had, because you, you did it all at the same time, had a comment in terms of the site plan specific to the uh, interest rate. Oh. Do, can thank I talk, you. Chris? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I was actually just about to ask that to see if um, council was to keep the 12% or um, raise it. I believe the increase would be up to 15% and maybe Barbara could um, maybe elaborate a bit better on that than I would probably be able to, but I believe that's um, the standard for the municipality. Barbara, did you want to comment? Is that, does 15% equate to, what What was it, one in a? Yeah, so a month? Um, yeah, it aligns with um, the interest uh, rate charged uh, for our property taxation. Uh, so it is 1.25% per month and that's 15% per annum. Okay, so I'm seeing nods around the table this time for Councillor Smith's recommendation. So do I have to reread the resolution of the execution of the site plan as amended? Okay, so for the sake of me not reading all the concessions and everything, does everyone understand that that's the authorized the execution of the site plan agreement as amended? Okay, and now I'm gonna read the conditions that a letter of credit be posted in the amount of $162,090 to cover securities for the development. Number two, registered owner to pay any outstanding taxes owed to the municipality of Dysart et al. And number three, registered owner to pay all administration fees owed to the municipality of Dysart et al. All in favor? Okay, and that passes. Okay, thank you. And sorry, Councillor Smith, when you do two things, I just realized I wrote that down so I wouldn't forget your first point. Um, okay, next we'll move on to uh, application to amend lands of Nomi. Yes, thank you. Uh, the owners of Nomi Resort have plans to continue with their development. Um, the development of their property is a health and wellness retreat. Um, they're requesting today to recognize an updated treatment design for the subject land, and this requires an amendment to the site plan. 
So they've amended their design, um, the design of their development to include individual septic systems and wells for each of the 51 standard style cottages, as opposed to the previous communal sewage and water systems. Um, they have received approval from uh, the MOE um, in terms of a, an approved ECA for, the, for 28 additional septic systems in, in addition to the existing lodge, which is phase one of the proposed development. Prior to phase two, they will need to update their ECA before they can move forward. Um, the proposal as submitted uh, generally aligns with the previously approved site plan, which was approved by council in 2015. Um, and staff are of the opinion that amendment to the agreement is not necessary. Um, if council choose to support this request, I have provided a resolution for your consideration and I'm happy to answer any questions council has. Any questions? Uh, Deputy Mayor Kennedy. Uh, yes, um, on this proposal, as far as the septic systems, I have no comment, but I, I just when I look at their, uh, their draft here, I don't see anywhere um, that uh, shows anything for handicapped parking. I'm wondering, will this project still have to go before the Accessibility Committee at the county before further or final approvals are, are made on this whole project? I just don't see any provision for that at all in here. Sorry, it's off this, topic a little bit, but. Yeah, they, they will be required to comply with zoning in terms of number of parking spaces and number of accessible parking spaces. Um, but to answer your question, this was not forwarded through uh, the accessible Accessibility Committee. I think it, 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 does the Accessibility Committee only review things that are of a public nature, not individual, like these are individual, going to be privately owned, rented out units. I don't know what the mandate, actually Mallory would know probably just as well, uh, what the mandate of the committee is. Yeah, typically when there's a um, large change uh, in, a, in a local development, we have been reviewing, and, and, and Deputy Mayor Kennedy would know this too, we have been reviewing um, new developments and so on just to ensure that the parking lots are, are mostly <laughs> designed properly because a lot everything inside the building of course goes by the building code and it has to be accessible for new build but in terms of site plans and so on we have been reviewing it at the accessibility committee level um i'm not sure not every planning application triggers it it, it, it kind of it's it, it's usually with newer newer builds or quite massive renovations that we've been looking at them but i also thought it was more for ones that are um have public, uh, a public component, whether it be like affordable housing projects, that's a public component, I, like a pri this is a, a private for sale or profit development. Yeah, and I will that's say a lot of the ones we've been, we've been reviewing do have, so they're either affordable housing or uh, yes. something that's literally a, camp, a county or municipal project. Exactly. Um, actually reached out to um, the county recently to get the uh, terms of reference for our accessibility committee so that our planning department has a better concept of when when we need mm -hmm. to go through that committee and just to ensure that we're doing it properly um, uh, and for future applications as well. Okay, good point. Jeff, did you have your hand up? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to state if this was new development, uh, staff would have forwarded it to the joint accessibility committee. Um, these cottages were approved by council in 2015. The change that's uh, before council today is just to recognize the updated sewage, seat, uh, sewage treatment design for the subject land. So uh, if it was a brand new proposal, we would have forwarded it to that committee. Oh, perfect. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. I should ask you first. Uh, I'll look for a mover in a second here if I could. Councillor Donaldson and Councillor Wood Roberts. Be it resolved that council approves the revised site plan dated August 4th, 2022, with respect to the lands of 2868395 Ontario Limited, known as No Meat Resort, Part Lot 25, Concessions 10 and 11, Township of Harcourt. The development is to comply with all provisions of zoning bylaw 2005 120 as amended. And, and in particular, the required planting strip along the rear lot line, which is Christine Road. An amendment to the site plan agreement is not necessary. All in favor? Okay, carried. Um, where are we? Uh, item D. Shore Road yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Through you, uh, bylaw 2022 83 is a bylaw to stop up and close and convey the, the shore road lines in front of the lands of Shields on Halliburton Lake. 
bylaw 2022-84 is a deeming bylaw to facilitate the merger of that lot with the shore road allowance. Uh, the notice and circulation requirements have been completed and no concerns have been identified. The purchase price of the shore road allowance has been set at $4,300 and staff recommend approval of both bylaws. If you have any questions, okay. I'm happy to answer them. So questions? Nope. Okay, mover seconder. Uh, Councilor McKechnie and Deputy Mayor Kennedy. Here is all the bylaw 2022-83, which is a bylaw to stop up, close and convey a portion of the original shore road allowance in front of part lot 14, concession four in the geographic township of Harburn. Be read a first, second and third time, pass sign and the corporate seal attached there too. And be it resolved that bylaw 2022-84, which is a bylaw to deem lot 27, registered plan 331 in the township of Harburn, not to be within a plan of subdivision for the purpose of section 50, of the Planning Act RSO 1990. As, um, as amended, sorry, be read a first, second and third time, pass, signed and the corporate seal attached there too. This bylaw is intended to allow Lot 27, Registered Plan 331 to merge with the road allowance, which has been closed and conveyed pursuant to, sec to bylaw 2022-83. All in favor? Okay, carried. And keep going. Yeah, th this file is this, uh, similar. Uh, bylaw 2022-85 is a bylaw to close and convey the shore road allowance in front of two abutting properties owned by the, the levees on Grass Lake. Um, there's also a deeming bylaw to facilitate the merger of those lots with the, the abutting shore road allowance. Um, the, the notice and circulation requirements are complete. Um, we did receive one call, just a general inquiry. No concerns have been identified. Uh, the purchase price of the shore road allowance is $4,000 per lot, um, and staff recommend approval of both bylaws. Okay, so any questions on this one? No, nope, seeing none. Mover in a seconder then. Councillor Wood Roberts and Councillor Smith. We resolve that bylaw 2022-85 which is a bylaw to stop up, close and convey a portion of the original shore road allowance in front of part lot 12, concession eight in the geographic township of Dysart, be read a first, second and third time, passed, signed and the corporate seal attached there too. And be it resolved that bylaw 2022-86, which is a bylaw to deem lots three and four, registered plan 405 in the township of Dysart, not to be within a plan of subdivision for the purpose of section 50 of the Planning Act RSO 1990, as amended, be read a first, second, and third time, pass, sign, and the corporate seal attached there too. This bylaw is intended to allow lots three and four, registered plan 405 to merge with the road allowance, which has been closed and conveyed pursuant to bylaw 2022-86. All in favor? Okay, carried. Uh, just one second, did I read that right? Shouldn't it say to 85 at the end? Can everybody read that? Shouldn't it say to conveyed pursuant, I read that it conveyed pursuant to bylaw 2022-85 because it should go to the first bylaw. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. That okay. is correct, thank you. That's okay. And I think, okay, so I did it all in favor? I can't remember if I did that, carried. Um, you put that in there to trick me. Um, now, what are we into? Harcourt Park, one IF. Oh. Yes. Um, yeah, so this is a new uh, new request. Ms. Okay. Scripcheck has made an application on behalf of Harcourt Park Incorporated to purchase the shore road allowance in front of her lease holdings on Allen Lake. The location of the dwelling, which is partially located on the shore road allowance, is recognized pursuant to the official plan. There is a pump house located on the shore road allowance as well. Uh, the applicants have agreed to remove that pump house or bring it into compliance. Um, staff have included a, a condition to that effect um, and staff request direction with regards to that pump house and additionally approval to process this application. Any questions? Go ahead. I had one question on the, uh, you, you got pictures here of a proposed location for garages one and three, uh, Two different spots, but I don't see anything in the application. Just wondering why you included a proposed area for a garage from the shoreline road allowance application. Is, is there something more coming on this property? 
That, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I'll tell you right now, though, they will not be able to build the, of any proposed garage on the shore road allowance. Uh, it's quite possible to lock coverage issue or it's um, perhaps they just want to uh, to purchase the shore road allowance just to own to own to the water's edge. Okay, we missed that. Um, I did too. Okay. Okay, well, it's a mystery. Go ahead, Councillor Smith. So uh, we are going to give uh, direction that the pump house needs to be removed or brought into compliance. Uh, uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Yep, that is definitely in the resolution that was included, but I'm just uh, can't find the picture of the. But I won't worry about it. Um, and uh, I I need to move her in a second here on this one. Okay, Councillor Donaldson and Councillor Smith. It resolved the council approves for processing an application by Harcourt Park Incorporated and the tenant's name is there. My apologies. I have no idea how to pronounce that. Can I just script over that? Say that again? Script check. Very good. To purchase, I'm sure they have to, have to spell that over and over again. To uh, purchase a portion of the shore road allowance along the shores of Allen Lake in front of her property, part lot two, concession seven in the geographic township of Harcourt. Pursuant to section 3.2.7 of the official plan, the pump house is to be removed or brought into compliance and the lands are declared surplus. All in favor? Okay, so that's carried. <coughs> Thank you. My apologies to her. It's not a easy one to say. Okay, so a deeming bylaw is next for Maroness. Correct. Thank Jones. you. Uh, at the council meeting uh, in July of 2020, uh, council passed a road closing bylaw which was a bylaw to close the adjacent original road allowance leading to water abutting this property. Um, at the time of uh, registration, the municipal solicitor uh, notified staff that there was no record of a deeming bylaw that would have the effect of merging that lot with the road allowance. Um, so staff are providing this for council direction today. Um, the proposed bylaw 2020-87 will merge lot 15, registered plan 619 with the road allowance creating one lot for development pur purposes as antip anticipated, sorry, a bit tongue-tied, as anticipated by the bylaw 2020-50. Staff recommend approval of that deeming bylaw and ask if there's any questions. Okay, just to just an oversight, it's like, yeah, that's okay. For instance, the last couple of applications, there has been the, there's, or the, not that Harcourt Park one, but the two before that, there's a bylaw, there's a second bylaw right away and it all. So move in a seconder on this one. Uh, Councillor Wood Roberts and Councillor McKechnie. You want a minute? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. We resolve the uh, bylaw 2022 87, which is a bylaw to deem lot 15, registered plan 619 in the geographic township of Guildford, not to be within a plan of subdivision for the purpose of section 50 of the Planning Act RSO 1990. As amended, be read a first, second, and third time, pass, sign, and the corporate seal attached thereto. This bylaw is intended to allow Lot 15, Registered Plan 619, to merge with the road allowance, which has been closed and conveyed pursuant to bylaw 2020 50. All in favor? Okay, so that's carried. And eight, Lot Addition, Lands of Warrington. Yes, thank you. This is uh, for the lands of Warrington. The proposal is essentially a reconfiguration of the uh, the original properties, utilizing the original road allowance uh, that will close that will be closed through bylaw 2022-20. Uh, no new lots are being proposed as a result of this application. Uh, as noted in the report, there is uh, an original road allowance that bisects um, lots one and two and lots two and uh, the original lot configuration on the original lot configuration. Uh, this road allowance is currently being closed through bylaw 2022-20. These lands will merge with the subject property and through the consent process will create the proposed severed and retained lots as shown on the, uh, the proposed plan. As outlined in the report, staff recommend that council support the general principle of the proposed consent as submitted subject to the included conditions provided in the report and comments received through the public review process and staff are here to answer any questions. Okay, I know that um, Councillor Smith, you went through this with fine tooth comb and found a couple little, you had some questions earlier, were they answered? 
Uh, I think, well, Chris has told me in an email that he's corrected those Perfect. in a public report. So I think that's good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, just some um, housekeeping uh, things. Anyone else? No? Okay, so then we have a mover and a seconder. Uh, Councillor McKechnie and Councillor Clark. We resolve that Council support the general principle of a severance proposal for file number D00 SB 2022 010 lands of Warrington, subject to the following conditions and the comments received through the public review process. Number one, registered owner to pay any outstanding taxes to the municipality of Dysart at all. Number two, registered owner to pay all administration fees owed to the municipality of Dysart at all. Number three, registered owner to complete the purchase of the original road allowance. Number four, registered owner to enter into a severance agreement with the municipality of Dysart at all. Number five, the registered owner shall submit to the satisfaction of the municipality of Dysart at all, a site development plan, including building location, septic system, well, driveway, and parking location and site drainage prepared by a certified OLS or similar profession for the severed lot. The registered owner to apply for a zoning bylaw amendment to the municipality of Dysart et al. for the severed lot. And lastly, number seven, prior to the endorsement of the deeds, the municipality is to provide a clearance letter to the Halliburton County Land Division Committee confirming that conditions one through six have been fulfilled. All in favor? Okay, carried. Um, okay, and next we have another uh, pre-consultation um, file there. That, that is correct. Uh, this is seven. for, uh, excuse me, this is for the uh, lands of Lewis. Um, just a brief outline, the two uh, separate shore lots historically existed known as lots 26 and 27. The owner of lots 26 and 27 purchased the back lot areas consisting of various unopened road allowances and parts on a survey. All the parcels were in the same name when the DME bylaw was passed. When the parcels were registered, they all merged into one property. As such, the, the applicant is proposing to sever the subject property into one severed lot and one retained lot. Brief description, the proposed severed property is fairly open with existing development and mixed, uh, and mixed vegetation. <coughs> Excuse me. The property also had three existing cabins with one of those cabins located within the shoreline setback. The cabins have uh, recently been demolished on the property. <coughs> a condition requiring a revegetation plan was included in order to rehabilitate the area. The official plan policies outline that where shoreline has been impaired by past activities, the owner is encouraged to restore the shoreline and shorelands back to the natural state. A natural state is considered um, for shorelines um, as trees and, those, and uh, various vegetation and not maintain lawn. The proposed severed property is designated waterfront areas and zone tourist commercial zone. As a condition for the zoning, uh, there was a zoning amendment that was included for the proposed property. The severance process uh, provides the opportunity to rezone the subject property for its current and intended use of waterfront residential. By request of the consultant, additional information of a site of site photos and a 2016 uh, planting plan has uh, been included with the report. Uh, I did include that this morning. Um, so if you scroll through the the um, the report towards the bottom, you'll see some um, photos and the planting plan, which um, the consultant is in attendance to speak a little bit further to. Uh, staff have also added uh, some additional photos for, with this report as well. Uh, subject to the imposed conditions and the comments received through the public review process, the proposed application will be consistent with the provincial policy statement and generally conform with the official plan and is recommended that Council support the general principle of the application for the lands of Lewis and the consultant Sue Harris is in attendance to speak further to the application. Okay, so probably, uh, Sue, I'll go to you first, uh, then before I open it up, you might want to add to the um, comments. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor Roberts. Um, yes, um, this is sort of an unfortunate circumstance. The Lewis have two houses. Um, the son, the agreement was the son would buy their original house and on the <coughs> separate lot, which they believed was a separate lot, uh, they were building their new house. And so the son at this point cannot finalize his, finalize his mortgage because of this error in the merged lot. 
and the uh, parents cannot finish building their house because they need the financing from the sale of the original property. And so they have um, unfortunately received bad legal advice and went to county council to rectify this a few months ago uh, with a validation of title. And when it got to the uh, county solicitor, he said, no, I don't agree. This is not the correct tool to achieve the end of um, fixing the merged lots and separating them out. He advised um, them to that he wasn't going to take the validation of title to county council. And he advised them to pursue a what he called a technical severance, which brings us to where we are today. Uh, so they have been many months uh, trying to resolve this problem. Um, so in that vein, um, I looked at the conditions that were proposed by staff and I've uh, raised this with Chris, so I'm not blindsiding him with my request, but I uh, respectfully asked council to consider slightly modifying a couple of these conditions, uh, considering the situation and the, the timeliness of getting this resolved. Um, so one of the conditions is um, the provision um, of, of a zoning amendment being um, to, satis to the satisfaction of Dysart. That, um, it would be pretty straightforward. We're moving from the tourist commercial um, where they've removed the three cottages and uh, aligning the zoning as a waterfront uh, residential four, so WR4. So to me, it's a pretty straightforward request. Um, and I'm asking to uh, council to consider changing the wording to uh, instead of having it go through the process and uh, delaying that for six to eight months, that the condition be that they submit um, the application and pay the application fee. So it would just uh, be a timely way for them to achieve the same intent, um, but not hold up them being able to meet the provisional conditions of the consent um, for another six to eight months while we processed a zoning amendment. Um, we don't have any problem with applying for it and pursuing it. It's just if the wording could be changed to submittal and payment of fees. Um, I'm gonna turn back to staff before I open up the floor for questions to, if, to follow that process. So it's uh, condition number six. Um, Correct. Thank you. That's correct. Um, so staff does do have a little bit of concern with the wording going that way, just that it doesn't lock in the zoning application as part of the approval process. So there isn't technically anything holding the applicant from following through with the zoning. It's, it would be sort of outside of the process, which um, could cause sort of an administrative burden if the applicant didn't follow through with that and could then put the onus on to taxpayer for those costs uh, that uh, are being um, uh, sort of accumulated through through that process. So that would just be our only concern, but we would look to council for direction on that. I'm just going to look back to Sue before. I mean, it's funny because I was reading about um, lot mergers for a, a different, uh, not to do with this property, something else I'm involved with. And um, where, it, so, oh my gosh, uh, the inadvertence of lots merging is incredible. And actually they're changing the law on that. So if Mr. and Mrs. Jones own a property and they think they're being very clever and this property besides only in Mr. Jones's name, but then some one passes and then now it's both names, it becomes one lot. There was a couple in Belleville or Brockville, I can't remember which, that ended up owning four houses in a row and they called that one, one lot because it was in the... It, is in the same name. So there are problems with the with the titles merging, and I feel for you in this case. Um, so I'd like to just hear from Sue specifically the words that you would or you're requesting us to put in, and then I'm going to go to Council uh, Deputy Mayor Kennedy. Can you be specific, uh, Sue? Uh, yes. Um, in six, then I would say subject to a zoning bylaw amendment being submitted and application fees paid subject to the satisfaction of the municipality of Dysart et al. And I, I guess I would just like to say uh, um, the Lewises have taken a pretty heavy financial hit trying to rectify this inadvertent merger. Um, and I'm quite, uh, I feel quite confident that paying a thousand, another thousand dollar fee for a zoning amendment, um, I don't 
imagine for any reason they would walk away from this. I, I think they inadvertently found themselves in a difficult situation. So I'm not sure that I see the difference between what you're saying and, what, and maybe I'm, I'm not <laughs> alert or not understanding the difference between what is in here and what you're saying. So my read, uh, my reading of um, condition number six implies that they have to, to meet that provisional condition, they have to go through the zoning amendment process, get it approved, bring that back to county council and say, okay. we've met your condition now. Whereas I'm saying that that will delay them another six to eight months. Okay. And so what I'm asking is that, you know, we provide the application, a complete application, we pay the fee, we submit. Um, so the process is underway. And again, as I said, it's a pretty straightforward one. We're changing from tours, commercial cottages are gone. Uh, lot is the same size as the one beside it. We want it. Um, the municipality wants it rezoned to WR4, um, which is perfectly reasonable. I don't see it as a, a controversial um, amendment. I don't see high risk of, um, you know, public opposition to the change. I think it's more an administrative household task. Um, and I, I prefer, I respectfully ask that uh, council not delay it six to eight months requiring okay. approval. I see the difference now. Um, I do have uh, Deputy Mayor Kennedy and then Councillor Smith. Uh, yeah, thanks Sue for that explanation. I, I, I'm glad you went through it twice. I caught it the second time. <laughs> <laughs> I probably didn't yeah. do it well the first time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, when I first read this, I was like, oh no, well, they got to go through the process. But then when I followed up with staff, I find, because I asked about how a building permit was issued for a second cottage on one, one property. And then when I asked the staff, uh, this still shows in our mapping that there's two separate lots. Yeah. So that's how they got the building permit. So I'm thinking, okay, so let's let's give the people some as much help as we can then to resolve this situation. So I'm fully in support of moving forward with uh, Sue's amendment. Okay. Very good. And uh, Councillor Smith. Uh, exactly the same. I, yeah. I I can't imagine any of them. In fact, I know some of the neighbors, and and they'll be glad that this is going to be rezoned as uh, as waterfront uh, residential as opposed to uh, commercial and. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's all good. They've taken action to improve the shoreline. And, uh, um, and so anything we can do to help them out would be uh, the right thing to do as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Sue, go ahead. Um, sorry, I, I do have an, another revision I'm requesting. So I, I, want, I didn't want to get to a resolution without raising my other concern that we first obviously finished the discussion on this. Sorry, I just no on the on. I, I think there is consensus to um, okay. take your wording for uh, condition six. Okay, that uh, um, yeah, and another. Go ahead. May I respectfully um, raise a second concern? Um, so there is a requirement which is uh, number five, and it, it says subject to a re. Uh, vegetation plan for the shorelands of the severed lot to the satisfaction of Dysart. So it wasn't until last night that I was aware that um, they had a, actually in 2016 hired a professional, done a shorelands <laughs> plan, implemented that. Uh, it is in place and the pictures show, um, I must say, it's a, I walked the property, it's a rather robust um, vegetation and trees. They're maturing well. Um, I, I think compared to most um, shoreline lots, it's certainly well vegetated. Um, clearly where the cottages were just removed, that doesn't exist. Um, I think that they have demonstrated that they are good stewards of the shorelands. Um, I think asking for, uh, we don't disagree with the idea that natural vegetation in the shorelands is important. I think the Lewises would be happy to um, agree that they will put natural vegetation in that area, not lawn, um, to the satisfaction of Dysart. But the requirement for the plan to me is onerous. Um, I can speak from personal experience in my company, trying to get a landscape plan for a small project in Halliburton County is next to impossible. Um, a lot of the landscape firms will tell you that they're booked out 2023 and quite frankly, this is not high 
um, for preparing like small little blankets. Um, and further, I think it would cost about $5,000. And so I'm asking that we change the wording again um, to say um, plant natural vegetation in the shorelands. Sue, so you're cutting you're cutting in just out in and out a bit. Maybe if you take your video off and then that might help. Okay. Just Happy there that we <laughs> Okay. Um all right. So I am asking that um we change the wording. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Um I am asking that we change the wording to not require a plan, but that um they agree to plant natural vegetation in the uh shorelands of the severed lot to the satisfaction of Dysart. And so the, the difference would be, rather than spending $5,000 on a plan that it might take them a year to get done some by someone qualified, um, that they put that money towards, you know, supplementing uh, the natural vegetation where the three cottages were removed. Uh, go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor Kennedy. Yeah, I concur. They already have a, a veg three vegetation plan in place for the other lot. So just carry on with that plan on the extension. So I, no sense reinventing the wheel here. They've already demonstrated they're good stewards of the land. And um, I don't think we need a separate plan for this little piece of property. Just extend the one we already have. Okay. Anyone else want to comment on that? I mean, the, the pictures demonstrate that they've already done quite a lot of work and they've already been to a... Um, specific uh, nursery to get shrubs. The uh, grant from Watersheds Canada was awarded to this project through Canisius Lake Cottages Association. I don't know how much more you can already do in advance. So is council uh, again, okay with the rechanging of the wording in this instance as well? Okay, so those are the two requests, Sue? Um, I will raise one more if possible, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I don't I'm know. Sorry. I know this one, I don't know. But anyway, um, uh, there was also the requirement that they do the uh, uh, pay parkland dedication fee for a, a new lot. Um, uh, that's uh, condition number three. And um, the lots were already in existence. Um, they still show on the mapping as an existence. And I'm just questioning, it's even acknowledged in the staff report that there's no new lot. Um, I'm just questioning whether it is fair to require parkland dedication fee uh, in this instance. Okay, so that's my uh, final request. <laughs> okay, well, that because there are only seven, and so you've got. Uh, <laughs> but I think we're all seeing that this was out of inadvertence. Plus, an awful lot of work's been done, and so we're not really creating a lot, which is the standard of why we collect the thousand um, dollar parkland dedication. Is there? agreement to remove that in total yes so uh subject to parkland dedication fee without that number three would be removed completely correct uh councillor smith um you know a quick reaction would be yes but maybe we could ask staff you know we've uh, mm -hmm. they brought forward these recommendations for some reason um and um, and so I'd like to get their perspective. Uh, um, sure, like because they're standard. All but, and maybe that is it. Maybe and yeah. maybe that's. Okay. Side. I don't know. No, let's All turn right. it over to staff. Uh, Jeff. Yeah, Chris, if I may, um, I think the request from the applicant is reasonable with regards to the parkland dedication. It has been paid before, so um, and council agreed to create the lots as currently designed or the intended design. Um, in terms of uh, the shoreline vegetation, as per the report and the pictures provided in the report, there appears to be good vegetative screening on the, on the property, but it does show maintained lawn in the area of the shoreline. So the official plan does note where the shoreline has been impaired by past activities, it should be restored to a natural state. And this just isn't in, in terms of that, the lawn, but also in terms of the, the cabin that's been removed. Um, and furthermore, the zoning bylaw does state that the shoreline vegetation buffer should be maintained in a natural state to the full depth of the water setback. So, so Chris's uh, recommended condition in that regard is, is based on policy. Obviously the, the decision is council to, 
councils to make, but we just wanted to provide that direction and, and just kind of refer to the pictures in the report. Um, okay, uh, Councillor Smith, comment? Well, um, you know, I've, I've got, uh, thanks for that, Jeff, and, and uh, a lot of sympathy. I hadn't interpreted the uh, number five there as being focused on a quote plan as opposed to, you know, taking some action. Uh, and, um, and so, um, you know, I would not have expected to have to go out and hire somebody to create a fancy plan document. Uh, but I would like a, a, a condition that, you know, at some point in the future, Dysart staff could go back and say, uh, folks, uh, this is all on here where these cabins used to be, uh, where's the veget you know, the natural vegetation that, that was supposed to be planted. As long as there's a, that sort of, uh, obligation to uh, to meet the standard that we've established with the uh, you know the official plan, um, I'm good with it. So I don't, I don't know what tool we'd have after hey. this to do that. I do see Sue with her hand up, though. Um, thank you, through you, Mayor Roberts. I I do think that is the intent. I mean, um, I acknowledge that you know where they have just taken the cottages down. Realistically, <laughs> it's been you know, a month. So they don't, haven't had time to, to address that and do the plantings, et cetera. Um, but I think the condition as I proposed um, is a condition that needs to be fulfilled before you go from provisional approval to final approval of the consent. And it does say uh, natural vegetation to the satisfaction of Dysart. So I, it's a condition of the provisional a provision, provisional approval of the consent that would have to be met. So I, I think it's covered. I just don't know what mechanism it would be to be like uh, after the fact, we don't have staff to go up and, and check it. Like we either, cause you're not, we're, we're sort of waving the thought that they have to submit a formal plan as to what your comments were. It's very hard to find an, uh, someone to do. And they've practically already done that already. Um, yeah. certainly, I mean, obviously lots of these things are just barely started. They're just little saplings, but they're, you know, they'll, they'll be there. So, uh, did someone, if, if yeah, I, sorry. If I may, um, I would, um, suggest it in terms of that in, I would be the one writing the clearance letter, right. To the County. And so what I would propose to do is again, take pictures before and after and say, here's the plantings they've put in. We've now you know, covered this area. And um, I feel that that condition has been met. And um, the county and the township can agree or disagree, but um, it is loose because there is no exact standard of what exactly has to be planted. Um, but there's uh, the intent. And as I said, they they won an award for their their previous yeah. efforts and um, and have robust landscaping there. So I I feel that they will continue to be good stewards of the land and and meet the requirement. Okay, um, is there any other further comments from councillors or any? Okay, a, a two. So Councillor Wood Roberts was first, and, and Deputy Mayor Kennedy for for this. Um, planning of the vegetation stuff, can that not come into the zoning bylaw aspect and leave it out of here? Which is months down the road and they'll have made progress on it by then? Is that a quest question to staff? I, I suppose, it could, okay. sorry, uh, if I may, I, I yep. suppose it could be. Uh, the intention of the wording of both those conditions using a plan um, tying that zoning condition to the to the approval process is, is it puts the responsibility on the applicant to ensure that stuff gets done. Uh, some when, when you remove that uh, that leverage or remove a plan, then it, it does increase more administration on staff side. But it is something that is required by the zoning bylaw, so it is something we can review during the zoning bylaw amendment. I, I think that's a great idea. Myself, um, De Deputy Mayor Kennedy. Yeah, just a little bit of confusion because our, our own official plan, section 5.1, that you've included in here, just uses the words encourage revegetation. It doesn't say shall, it says in effect may or um, encourage. So I think past practice has already identified this landowner is more than uh, willing to do whatever it takes to get his long property in great shape. So I, I don't see any need for further restrictions on them other than. Uh, 
just what we just talked about with the zoning, maybe. Okay. Just for the follow up. Yeah. So, okay, because uh, there's been several changes, I can't read what's in front of me. So, first of all, do you think the discussion is finished? I think we've sort of gone through. So, you've asked the three requests. Anything yes, the applicant wants to add? Does anything the applicant himself wants to add? Nope. So, okay. Um, Mallory, how would I uh, go about? Yep, Mallory. Yeah. Um, so, did we have a, uh, was everyone in a, agreement that we're removing the shoreline uh, vegetation part from the list and, and making it part of the zoning application later on? Before I continue. I, be I believe so. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just. Yeah, I'm, no, and I'm looking around the table and looking at you too. And is that what the concurrence was? Yes, it nods. Yes. So okay, basically, so we're taking out three and, and uh, five. Exactly. So and I'm rewording just, six, which won't be six anymore. No. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm going to slowly read what we have. And Sue, Sue, you have your hand up. Um, I, it, sorry, it was up and it has not gone down. I'm not sure oh, why. Okay. Okay, here, that's okay. Lower yeah. hand. Here I will go. Sorry, I apologize. Okay, so I'm going to read what I have, and I want everyone to pay attention because <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've been doing some rejigging as we go. Okay, so be resolved that council support the general principle for file number D00 SV 2022 009 Lands of Lewis, subject to the following conditions and the comments received through the, through the public review process. One, register owner to pay all outstanding taxes. Two, register owner to pay all administrative fees owed to the municipality of Dysart et al. Three, subject to the demolished building material being removed from the separate lot. Four, subject to a zoning bylaw amendment being submitted and application fees being paid to the satisfaction of Dysart et al. And endorsement of the deeds the municipality is to provide a clearance letter to the Halliburton County Land Division Committee confirming that conditions one to four have been fulfilled. Is that okay? So we all paid attention. <laughs> I'm going to look for a mover and a seconder. Uh, Councillor McKechnie and Councillor Wood Roberts. All in favor. And that carries. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome. That was unusual. Uh, <laughs> and also too, Sue, were you aware that they are looking at changing that law in terms of the deeming uh, merging of properties? Uh, yes, um, I have an application that will come uh, to County Council um, mm -hmm. and it involves Dysart too. So we, we are, it'll come in in the next couple of weeks for a cancellation of consents, it's called. And okay. then it will, actually that's maybe the opposite of what you were talking about. Like the, there are three lots that will become one. Oh, okay. No, yeah, this is where lots have merged inadvertently way. because of names being, even though as careful as plan and estate planning hasn't happened and, or, and uh, so lots have merged, like I say, one right. you know, either Bell Belleville, Rockville, where somebody owns four houses and they became one lot. And yeah. it's particularly also in farmland where these uh, large hundred acre parcels and that type of thing. Okay. Anyway, that's just a sidebar. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're on to pre-consultation for lands of DeMarco. Thank you. Uh, this proposal, uh, this application is to apply for, actually, I think is, uh, sorry, before I start is- yeah, the, Melissa. the applicant, I don't see Melissa Markham uh, will be brought oh, in. Rare. There she is, yeah, thank you. Uh, the uh, purpose of this application is to uh, apply for a right-of-way over the subject lands to benefit the existing island property on Kinesis Lake. Uh, council may remember uh, this application for rezoning, um, I believe it was a few months ago, came in. And uh, this is now just following up on that to provide that uh, legal access. Uh, the benefiting lands, uh, the island property, are the subject of the site-specific zoning bylaw application to permit the development of the island with, uh, with a dwelling and related accessory structure. The right-of-way application is required um, in order to legally secure the parking and access to the island and will be located on the main land property known as the subject lands. Uh, brief description, the subject property is well treated with mixed vegetation and gradually slopes to the shoreline, which is Kinesis Lake. 
The subject property is developed with an existing seasonal dwelling, deck, and floating dock. The Bedevity property is the island and located within the northeast shores of Kinesis Lake. Subject to the recommendation uh, and conditions and comments received through mm -hmm. the public process, it is recommended that Council support the general principle of the proposed consent as submitted and uh, happy to address any questions. And I believe Melissa is here to um, further speak to the application if needed. Okay, thanks, Chris. So Melissa, is there anything you want to add to the report? I thank you, Mayor, Council and staff. Um, just wanted to say as well how fantastic your staff is in working with them on all these applications. They constantly get back to us and, uh, you know, I really always appreciate all their help that they give us on these applications. So I'll keep it short. It's been a long morning. So just really, I think that uh, Chris provided a great overview on this application. Um, I won't go into great detail. I do have some pictures in case it's going to be helpful later on. I could pull those up. As Chris mentioned, it's related to a county application H1922, which is an easement for right of way to provide for land access. Um, he did mention that it's as a result of an application that was before this council in April, and the applicants are working to remove the holding provision that was put on through that zoning bylaw at that time. Uh, the provision stipulated that mainland parking requirements be addressed, and that's what this application is here before council to do today. As Chris mentioned, the existing lands are developed with a cottage, deck, and a dock, and the application proposes a right-of-way, which includes parking and an access dock, along with a driveway, and it will follow an existing trail to the, um, to the proposed dock. The application is an easement for parking and a dock for access to the island property. As Chris mentioned, uh, the island's about two kilometers from the proposed mainland access. No clearing or site alterations anticipated as the parking area is clear. There's an existing trail in the location of the proposed dock as well. Um, as Chris also mentioned, the existing development on the property. So with the addition of the new dock, the provisions of the marine facility uh, will be maintained. So in calculating the cumulative width of these structures on the property, the property has a frontage of about 36 meters, which is set out, it's on actually a, a lot on a plan, registered plan of subdivision. So that's where that frontage came from. And it permits a maximum width of 10.8 meters for marine facilities. Um, there was a deck that, that's actually existing on the property that has sustained some damage over time. So in constructing the new dock on the property for access, uh, the owners of the property will ensure that everything that they're proposing will maintain the, uh, the zoning bylaw. But if there's any further questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no, it was a very detailed report. So uh, don't imagine too many questions. Uh, go, go ahead, Councillor Smith. Thank you. So I uh, uh, appreciate the, the comments. I haven't... Uh, you know, seen the property, but I was looking at your site sketch here and that uh, deck slash dock, the, the existing one looked uh, pretty large, but you're saying it'll be reduced in size so that you'll still be at or under the 30% of your waterfront uh, width consumed by now the combination of the existing and the, and the new uh, access dock. Is that fair? Uh, through you, Mayor. Yes. Uh, at the 30%, they're permitted 10.8 meters in width for the property. Um, at current, the deck. So the deck is actually on land. I don't believe, maybe Chris can correct me, I don't believe it's included within the cumulative width for marine facilities. But even if you were to take the width of that deck at about 8.5 meters, that would still uh, leave additional space for the proposed dock to be included. At this point, the owners are looking at a 1.2 meter wide deck. So that would definitely meet the intent of the width. Okay. okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Just a, a follow up then, and to uh, to staff. Uh, um, you know, most of the time when we're doing something like this, there's going to be a building permit for the existing lot, and so our staff will be out there doing inspections and be able to say, "Yep, that new uh, structure is uh, compliant." Um, would they be? What sort of follow up would there be with this? Will we be using this uh, same lot to access the island for our building permit inspections, or will we be uh, like? When do we come back and validate that the the new structures are all compliant? Uh, thank you. Uh, so we did add a condition, um, which is well, we it was part of the uh, the report, which the register owners submit final survey um, and review uh, prior to registration staff will review that um, and any building permits um, on the property like staff would staff would follow up in this case um, we would just review the final plan um, being provided to ensure that it meets the uh, the zoning provisions of, of the bylaw so um, that's why we have that additional condition in there so we'd um, on that final plan we would have that they would show the uh, the dock and, and those things just to ensure that that's proper 
that it meets the zoning requirements. But Councillor Smith, was your question to when the construction begins on the island of the cottage, or is our building inspector taken over through this method? Through this, is that correct? Well, I was just uh, wondering, you know, when our staff would have a chance to validate that uh, mm -hmm. whatever the new structures are, that they're compliant and uh, simple as that. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So, as I understand it. We're just going to rely upon uh, the submission. Uh, some survey submission at a later date. Is that correct? I would suspect, yes. Yes, we're, we're speaking just of the on land and not the island property, correct? Just of this one that we're, we're speaking yes, to that's now. True. Yes, yeah, yeah. so we would we would rely on the final survey um, that they're providing and then um, anything above and beyond that, if uh, they're out of compliance, uh, would be a follow up uh, by the bylaw. Um, if there's any concerns with a dock being too large or those type of things, then it would be follow up and um, enforced by the bylaw. Okay, good. Thank you for that then. I think that concludes questions. So I'll look for a mover and a seconder. Council Deputy Mayor Kennedy and Councillor Smith. We resolve that council support the general principle of a proposal for consent file number D00-SV-2022-011 lands of DeMarco subject to the following conditions in the comments received through the public review process. Number one, registered donor to pay any outstanding taxes. Number two, registered donor to pay all administration fees to the municipality of Dysart et al. Number three, registered owner to submit the final survey to the municipality of Dysart et al. for review prior to registration. And number four, prior to the endorsement of the deeds, the property owner must request that the municipality provide a clearance letter to the Halliburton County Land Division Committee confirming that conditions one through three have been fulfilled. All in favor? Okay, so that's carried. Thank you very Thanks much. Very much. Yeah, thank you. Oh my gosh, is that the end of planning already? Oh, <laughs> just kidding. Okay. Thanks. And that was, I forgot to say when Melissa went off screen, that was a nice compliment. I know how busy the planning department is. We're in the process of uh, shortly being hiring uh, somebody else in that department. Um, every time I go in either one of your offices, it, it's just files. Um, okay, so next we have just a couple little things before we conclude. We've got the draft minutes of the committee, the whole. So I'll look for a mover and a seconder for that. With Councillor McKechnie and Deputy Mayor Kennedy. We resolve that Council acknowledges receipt of the draft minutes of the August 9th, 2022 Committee of the Whole as information. All in favor? Okay, that carried. The Sign and Property Standards Committee minutes are there. I don't know, Councillor Clark, did you want to speak to anything on that or just? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, Mallory? There's no mic on. So if you guys are saying it, oh, no one did ask you. So I, I, did, I just asked <laughs> Councillor Clark, yeah. as chair of the committee, if there's anything he wanted to say. And he, he just commented, we, we did get a little bit of press on this. It's a very. Yeah. Um, very important to our community to see that uh, the municipality follows up. So, um, and, and it was an unusual circumstance when someone had an appeal. We hadn't uh, only dealt with that one other time that I can recall, and it was for a matter of small, much smaller matter. So, um, so there we go. Okay, mover and seconder to receive the draft minutes. Uh, Councilor Clark and seconded by Councilor Wood Roberts. We result that council acknowledges receipt of the draft minutes of the August 4, 2022 Sign and Property Standards Committee as information. All in favor? Okay, carried. So next, I have put a star beside notice of motion because I do believe there are uh, some coming and one from Councillor Wood Roberts. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to put forth a notice of motion. Um, there's uh, been happening frequently over the summer. There are a lot of confusion about the parking control regulations in town. Um, there's been an increase in, in ticketing. Um, and I think that we need a very clean and concise and consolidated bylaw for our parking bylaw. Hasn't been completely uh, revisited since 2010. So I would just like it to be resolved that council directs staff to consolidate parking bylaw 2010-42 and its amendments into one comprehensive parking control bylaw. 
Okay, so um, so it's something like that would then be brought back to council for yeah. comment and whatever. So that has been moved. Is there a second or two? Uh, so it was seconded by Councillor Clark. So that's supported. All in favor? And that's carried. And because you read that verbally, can you submit that in writing to the clerk? Yes. Perfect. Okay, Mallory. Got it all. Deputy Mayor Kennedy. Uh, just a question. I think it's a great uh, notice. I just in that would we also maybe consider looking at getting rid of parking? Would that be part of that discussion? Paid. Uh, getting rid of paid you parking. Still have I'm to have sorry. Parking yeah, yeah, I, I realize. Sorry. Driveways paid flooded. parking. Um, but Absolutely. Would that be part of that discussion? Sure. Okay. I don't know if this council can do that because there'd be uh, budget implications, but it's less than 50,000. Well, even with the notice of motion, it's still a matter of, uh, yes, you bring the, a bylaw back, but uh, I certainly think we can start a conversation. Okay. <laughs> don't know where we'll get with decision making in, in a couple of months anyway. Um, and uh, okay, so that's been received and approved. I actually have a notice of motion. Um, which I believe I'm allowed to do. And it's in light of what I talked about earlier today at the beginning of the meeting regarding policy 38. Really, staff never got direction uh, about whether they're are they supposed to bring it back. Should we throw it out the window? Should we compare others? So my I am going to, can I, I can move it, right, Mallory? Sure, if you're the one bringing it forward, we're a small council, so you can move it, yep. Okay. Be it resolved that council directs staff to bring policy 38 being a policy to establish a local municipal protocol for the review of telecommunication tower proposals to a future meeting for council to review. So does anyone want to second my motion? Councillor Smith is seconding my, I thought you wanted to speak to it. So I'm going to put that I have moved in and Councillor Smith seconded. Uh, for a vote, all in favor? Okay, great. So that carries as well. Is that any other further notice of motion? Nope. We then have a confirming bylaw for the proceedings for today. Anybody? Councillor Donaldson, Councillor Smith. We are told that bylaw number 2022-88 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the regular council meeting held on August 23rd, 2022, be read a first, second, and third time pass sign and the corporate seal attached here too. All in favor. Excellent, carried. And lastly, just a motion to adjourn. Councillor Donaldson, Deputy Mayor Kennedy. <clears throat> Beers old, the council adjourn its regular meeting held on August 23rd, 2022 at 12.04 p.m. All in favor? Carried. Okay, we are now officially adjourned. Thanks everyone, thanks all staff. Yes.